Section 10 of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza, translated by Robert Harvey Munro Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 9. Other questions concerning the same books, namely, whether they were completely finished by Ezra, and further, whether the marginal notes which are found in the Hebrew texts were various readings. How greatly the inquiry we have just made concerning the real writer of the twelve books aids us in attaining a complete understanding of them may be easily gathered solely from the passages which we have adduced in confirmation of our opinion and which would be most obscured without it. But besides the question of the writer, there are other points to notice which common superstition forbids the multitude to apprehend. Of these the chief is that Ezra, whom I will take to be the author of the aforementioned books until some more likely person be suggested, did not put the finishing touches to the narratives contained therein, but merely collected the histories from various writers and sometimes simply set them down, leaving their examination and arrangement to posterity. The cause, if it were not untimely death, which prevented him from completing his work in all its portions, I cannot conjecture. But the fact remains most clear, although we have lost the writings of the ancient Hebrew historians, and can only judge from the few fragments which are still extant. For the history of Hezekiah, Second Kings, chapter 18, verse 17, as written in the vision of Isaiah, is related as it is found in the chronicles of the kings of Judah. We read the same story, told with few exceptions, in the same words, in the book of Isaiah, which was contained in the chronicles of the kings of Judah, Second Chronicles, chapter 32, verse 32. From this we must conclude that there were various versions of this narrative of Isaiah's, unless indeed anyone would dream that in this too there lurks a mystery. Further, the last chapter of Second Kings, verses 27 to 30 is repeated in the last chapter of Jeremiah, chapter 5, verses 31 to 34. Again, we find in Second Samuel, chapter 7, repeated in First Chronicles, chapter 17, but the expressions in the two passages are so curiously varied that we can very easily see that these two chapters were taken from two different versions of the history of Nathan. Lastly, the genealogy of the kings of Idumea contained in Genesis chapter 36 verse 31, is repeated in the same words in First Chronicles chapter 1, though we know that the author of the latter work took his materials from other historians, not from the twelve books we have ascribed to Ezra. We may therefore be sure that if we still possess the writings of the historians, the matter would be made clear. However, as we have lost them, we can only examine the writings still extant, and from their order and connection, their various repetitions, and, lastly, the contradictions and dates which they contain, judge of the rest. These, then, or the chief of them, we will now go through. First, in the story of Judah and Tamar, Genesis chapter 38, the historian thus begins, And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren. This time cannot be referred to what immediately precedes, but must necessarily refer to something else. For from the time when Joseph was sold into Egypt to the time when the patriarch Jacob, with all his family, set out thither, cannot be reckoned as more than twenty-two years. For Joseph, when he was sold by his brethren, was seventeen years old, and when he was summoned by Pharaoh from prison, was thirty. If to this we add the seven years of plenty and two of famine, the total amounts to twenty-two years. Now, in so short a period, no one can suppose that so many things happened as are described, that Judah had three children, one after the other, from one wife whom he married at the beginning of the period, that the eldest of these, when he was old enough, married Tamar, and that after he died his next brother succeeded to her, that after all this Judah, without knowing it, had intercourse with his daughter-in-law, and that she bore him twins, and finally, that the eldest of these twins became a father within the aforesaid period. As all these events cannot have taken place within the period mentioned in Genesis, the reference must necessarily be to something treated of in another book. And Ezra, in this instance, simply related the story and inserted it without examination among his other writings. However, 
not only this chapter but the whole narrative of joseph and jacob is collected and set forth from various histories inasmuch as it is quite inconsistent with itself for in genesis chapter forty seven we are told that jacob when he came at joseph's bidding to salute pharaoh was one hundred and thirty years old if from this we deduct the twenty-two years which he passed sorrowing for the absence of joseph and the seventeen years forming joseph's age when he was sold and lastly the seven years for which jacob served for rachel we find that he was very advanced in life namely eighty-four when he took leah to wife whereas dinah was scarcely seven years old when she was violated by shechem simeon and levi were aged respectively eleven and twelve when they spoiled the city and slew all the males therein with a sword there is no need that i should go through the whole pentateuch if any one pays attention to the way in which all the histories and precepts in these five books are set down promiscuously and without order with no regard for dates and further how the same story is often repeated sometimes in a different version he will easily i say discern that all the materials were promiscuously collected and heaped together in order that they might at some subsequent time be more readily examined and reduced to order not only these five books but also the narratives contained in the remaining seven going down to the destruction of the city are compiled in the same way for who does not see that in judges chapter two verse six a new historian is being quoted who had also written of the deeds of joshua and that his words are simply copied for after our historian has stated in the last chapter of the book of joshua that joshua died and was buried and has promised in the first chapter of judges to relate what happened after his death in what way if he wished to continue the thread of his history could he connect the statement here made about joshua with what had gone before so too first samuel chapter seventeen and eighteen are taken from another historian who assigns a cause for david's first frequenting saul's court very different from that given in chapter sixteen of the same book for he did not think that david came to saul in consequence of the advice of saul's servants as is narrated in chapter sixteen but that being sent by chance to the camp by his father on a message to his brothers he was for the first time remarked by saul on the occasion of his victory over goliath the philistine and was retained at his court i suspect the same thing has taken place in chapter twenty six of the same book for the historian there seems to repeat the narrative given in chapter twenty four according to another man's version but i pass over this and go on to the computation of dates in first kings chapter six it is said that solomon built the temple in the four hundred and eightieth year after the exodus from egypt but from the historians themselves we get a much longer period for moses governed the people in the desert forty years joshua who lived one hundred and ten years did not according to josephus and others opinion rule more than twenty-six years cushan rishathaim held the people in subjection eight years othniel son of kenag was judged for forty years eglon king of moab governed the people eighteen years ehud and shamgar were judges eighty years yachin king of canaan held the people in subjection twenty years the people was at peace subsequently for forty years it was under subjection to midian seven years it obtained freedom under gideon for forty years it fell under the rule of abimelech three years tola son of pua was judge twenty-three years jair was judge twenty-two years the people was in subjection to the philistines and ammonites eighteen years jephthah was judge six years ibzan the bethlehemite was judge seven years elon the zebulonite ten years abdon the parathonite eight years the people was again subject to the philistines forty years samson was judge twenty years eli was judge forty years the people again fell into subjection to the philistines till they were delivered by samuel twenty years david reigned forty years solomon reigned before he built the temple four years all these periods added together make a total of five hundred and eighty years but to these must be added the years during which the hebrew republic flourished after the death of joshua until it was conquered by cushan rishathaim which i take to be very numerous for i cannot bring myself to believe 
that immediately after the death of joshua all those who had witnessed his miracles died simultaneously nor that their successor at one stroke bid farewell to their laws and plunged from the highest of virtue into the depth of wickedness and obstinacy nor lastly that kushan rishathaim subdued them on the instant each one of these circumstances requires almost a generation and there is no doubt that judges chapter two verses seven nine and ten comprehends a great many years which it passes over in silence we must also add the years during which samuel was judge the number of which is not stated in scripture and also the years during which saul reigned which are not clearly shown from his history it is indeed stated in first samuel chapter thirteen verse one that he reigned two years but the text in that passage is mutilated and the records of his reign lead us to suppose a longer period that the text is mutilated i suppose no one will doubt who has ever advanced so far as the threshold of the hebrew language for it runs as follows saul was in his blank year when he began to reign and he reigned two years over israel who i say does not see that the number of the years of saul's age when he begins to reign has been omitted that the record of the reign presupposes a greater number of years is equally beyond doubt for in the same book chapter twenty seven verse seven it is stated that david sojourned among the philistines to whom he had fled on account of saul a year and four months thus the rest of the reign must have been comprised in a space of eight months which i think no one will credit josephus at the end of the sixth book of his antiquities thus corrects the texts saul reigned eighteen years while samuel was alive and two years after his death however all the narrative in chapter thirteen is in complete disagreement with what goes before at the end of chapter seven it is narrated that the philistines were so crushed by the hebrews that they did not venture during samuel's life to invade the borders of israel but in chapter thirteen we are told that the hebrews were invaded during the life of samuel by the philistines and reduced by them to such a state of wretchedness and poverty that they were deprived not only of weapons with which to defend themselves but also of the means of making more i should be at pains enough if i were to try and harmonize all the narratives contained in this first book of samuel so that they should seem to be all written and arranged by a single historian but i will return to my object the years then during which saul reigned must be added to the above computation and lastly i have not counted the years of the hebrew anarchy for i cannot from scripture gather their number i cannot i say be certain as to the period occupied by the events related in judges chapter seventeen on till the end of the book it is thus abundantly evident that we cannot arrive at a true computation of years from the histories and further that the histories are inconsistent themselves on the subject we are compelled to confess that these histories were compiled from various writers without previous arrangement and examination not less discrepancy is found between the dates given in the chronicles of the kings of judah and those in the chronicles of the kings of israel in the latter it is stated that jehoram the son of ahab began to reign in the second year of the reign of jehoram the son of jehoshaphat second kings chapter one verse seventeen but in the former we read that jehoram the son of jehoshaphat began to reign in the fifth year of jehoram the son of ahab second kings chapter eight verse sixteen any one who compares the narratives in chronicles with the narratives in the books of kings will find many similar discrepancies these there is no need for me to examine here and still less am i called upon to treat of the commentaries of those who endeavour to harmonise them the rabbis evidently let their fancy run wild such commentators as i have read dream invent and at last resort play fast and loose with the language for instance when it is said in second chronicles that ahab was forty-two years old when he began to reign they pretend that these years are computed from the reign of omri not from the birth of ahab if this can be shown to be the real meaning of the writer of the book of chronicles all i can say is that he did not know how to state a fact the commentators make many other assertions of this kind which if true would prove that the ancient hebrews were ignorant both of their own language and of the way to relate a plain narrative i should in such case recognize no rule or reason in interpreting scripture but it would be permissible to hypothesize to one's heart's content if any one thinks that i am speaking too generally and without sufficient warrant 
I would ask him to set himself to showing us some fixed plan in these histories which might be followed without blame by other writers of chronicles, and in his efforts at harmonizing an interpretation, so strictly to observe and explain the phrases and expressions, the order and the connections, that we may be able to imitate these also in our writings. If he succeeds, I will at once give him my hand, and he shall be to me as great Apollo. For I confess that after long endeavours I have been unable to discover anything of the kind. I may add that I set down nothing here which I have not long reflected upon, and that, though I am imbued from my boyhood up with the ordinary opinions about the scriptures, I have been unable to withstand the force of what I have urged. However, there is no need to detain the reader with this question and drive him to attempt an impossible task. I merely mention the fact in order to throw light on my intention. I now pass on to other points concerning the treatment of these books, for we must remark, in addition to what has been shown, that these books were not guarded by posterity with such care that no faults crept in. The ancient scribes draw attention to many doubtful readings and some mutilated passages, but not to all that exist. Whether the faults are of sufficient importance to greatly embarrass the reader, I will not now discuss. I am inclined to think that they are of minor moment to those, at any rate, who read the scriptures with enlightenment, and I can positively affirm that I have not noticed any fault or various reading in doctrinal passages sufficient to render them obscure or doubtful. There are some people, however, who will not admit that there is any corruption, even in other passages, but maintain that by some unique exercise of providence, God has preserved from corruption every word in the Bible. They say that the various readings are the symbols of profoundest mysteries, and that mighty secrets lie hid in the twenty-eight hiatus which may occur, nay, even in the very form of the letters. Whether they are actuated by folly and anal devotion, or whether by arrogance and malice, so that they alone may be held to possess the secrets of God, I know not. This much I do know, that I find in their writings nothing which has the air of a divine secret, but only childish lucubrations. I have read and known certain cabalistic triflers, whose insanity provokes my unceasing astonishment. That faults have crept in will, I think, be denied by no sensible person who reads the passage about Saul, above quoted, First Samuel, chapter 13, verse 1, and also Second Samuel, chapter 6, verse 2. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Judah, to bring up from thence the ark of God. No one can fail to remark that the name of their destination, viz. Kirjath Jearim, has been omitted. Nor can we deny that Second Samuel chapter thirteen verse thirty-seven has been tampered with and mutilated. And Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, king of Geshur, and he mourned for his son every day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur, and was there three years. I know that I have remarked other passages of the same kind, but I cannot recall them at the moment. That the marginal notes which are found continually in the Hebrew codices are doubtful readings will, I think, be evident to every one who has noticed that they often arise from the great similarity of some of the Hebrew letters, such, for instance, as the similarity between Kaf and Beth, Jod and Vau, Daleth and Reth, etc. For example, the text in Second Samuel chapter five verse twenty four runs, "In the time when thou hearest," and similarly in Judges chapter twenty one verse twenty two, and it shall be when their fathers or their brothers come unto us often. The marginal version is, "Come unto us to complain." So also many various readings have arisen from the use of the letters named mutes, which are generally not sounded in pronunciation and are taken promiscuously one for the other. For example, in Leviticus chapter 25 verse 29 it is written, The house shall be established which is not in the walled city, but the margin has it which is in a walled city. Though these matters are self-evident, it is necessary to answer the reasonings of certain Pharisees by which they endeavour to convince us that the marginal notes serve to indicate some mystery and were added or pointed out by the writers of the sacred books. The first of these reasons, which in my opinion carries little weight, is taken from the practice of reading the scriptures aloud. If it is urged these notes were added to show various readings which could not be decided upon by posterity, 
Why has custom prevailed that the marginal readings should always be retained? Why has the meaning which is preferred been set down in the margin when it ought to have been incorporated in the text and not relegated to a side note? The second reason is more specious and is taken from the nature of the case. It is admitted that faults have crept into the sacred writings by chance and not by design. But they say that in the five books the word for a girl is, with one exception, written without the letter he. Contrary to all grammatical rules, whereas in the margin it is written correctly according to the universal rule of grammar. Can this have happened by mistake? Is it possible to imagine a clerical error to have been committed every time the word occurs? Moreover, it would have been easy to supply the emendation. Hence, when these readings are not accidental or corrections of manifest mistakes, it is supposed that they must have been set down on purpose by the original writers and have a meaning. However, it is easy to answer such arguments. As to the question of custom having prevailed in the reading of the marginal versions, I will not spare much time for its consideration. I know not the promptings of superstition, and perhaps the practice may have arisen from the idea that both readings were deemed equally good or tolerable, and therefore, lest either should be neglected, one was appointed to be written, and the other to be read. They feared to pronounce judgment in so weighty a matter, lest they should mistake the false for the true, and therefore they would give preference to neither, as they must necessarily have done, if they had commanded one only to be both read and written. This would be especially the case where the marginal readings were not written down in the sacred books, or the custom may have originated because some things, though rightly written down, were desired to be read otherwise, according to the marginal version, and therefore the general rule was made that the marginal version should be followed in reading the scriptures. The cause which induced the scribes to expressly prescribe certain passages to be read in the marginal version, I will now touch on. For not all the marginal notes are various readings, but some mark expressions which have passed out of common use, obsolete words and terms which current decency did not allow to be read in a public assembly. The ancient writers, without any evil intention, employed no courtly paraphrase, but called things by their plain names. Afterwards, through the spread of evil thoughts and luxury, words which could be used by the ancients without offence came to be considered obscene. There was no need for this cause to change the text of Scripture. Still, as a concession to the popular weakness, it became the custom to substitute more decent terms for words denoting sexual intercourse, excreta, etc., and to read them as they were given in the margin. At any rate, whatever may have been the origin of the practice of reading scripture, according to the marginal version, it was not that the true interpretation is contained therein. For besides that, the rabbins in the Talmud often differ from the Masoretes and give other readings which they approve of, as I will shortly show. Certain things are found in the margin which appear less warranted by the uses of the Hebrew language. For example, in Second Samuel chapter 14, verse 22, we read, In that the king hath fulfilled the request of his servant, a construction plainly regular and agreeing with that in chapter 16. But the margin has it, of thy servant, which does not agree with the person of the verb. So too, chapter 16 verse 25 of the same book we find as if one had inquired at the oracle of god the margin adding someone to stand as a nominative to the verb but the correction is not apparently warranted for it is a common practice well known to grammarians in the hebrew language to use the third person singular of the active verb impersonally the second argument advanced by the pharisees is easily answered from what has just been said, namely, that the scribes, besides the various readings, called attention to the obsolete words. For there is no doubt that in Hebrew, as in other languages, changes of use made many words obsolete and antiquated, and such were found by the later scribes in the sacred books and noted by them with a view to the books being publicly read according to custom. For this reason, the word Nahgar is always found marked because its gender was originally common, and it has the same meaning as the Latin juvenis, a young person. So also the Hebrew capital was anciently called Jerusalem, not Jerusalem. As to the pronouns himself and herself, I think that the later scribes changed vow to jod, a very frequent change in Hebrew, 
when they wished to express the feminine gender, but that the ancients only distinguished the two genders by a change of vowels. I may also remark that the irregular tenses of certain verbs differ in the ancient and modern forms, it being formerly considered a mark of elegance to employ certain letters agreeable to the ear. In a word, I could easily multiply proofs of this kind if I were not afraid of abusing the patience of the reader. Perhaps I shall be asked how I became acquainted with the fact that all these expressions are obsolete. I reply that I have found them in the most ancient Hebrew writers in the Bible itself, and that they have not been imitated by subsequent authors, and thus they are recognized as antiquated, though the language in which they occur is dead. But perhaps someone may press the question, why, if it be true, as I say, that the marginal notes of the Bible generally mark various readings, there are never more than two readings of a passage, that in the text and that in the margin, instead of three or more, and further, how the scribes can have hesitated between two readings, one of which is evidently contrary to grammar, and the other a plain correction. The answer to these questions also is easy. I will premise that it is almost certain that there once were more various readings than those now recorded. For instance, one finds many in the Talmud which the Masoretes have neglected, and are so different one from the other that even the superstitious editor of the Bomberg Bible confesses that he cannot harmonize them. We cannot say anything, he writes, except what we have said above, namely, that the Talmud is generally in contradiction to the Masoretes, so that we are not bound to hold that there never were more than two readings of any passage, yet I am willing to admit, and indeed I believe, that more than two readings are never found, and for the following reasons. 1. The cause of the differences of reading only admits of two, being generally the similarity of certain letters, so that the question resolved itself into which should be written, Beth or Kaf, Jod or Vau, Daleth or Reth, cases which are constantly occurring and frequently yielding a fairly good meaning, whichever alternative be adopted. Sometimes, too, it is a question whether a syllable be long or short, quantity being determined by the letters called mutes. Moreover, we never asserted that all the marginal versions without exception marked various readings. On the contrary, we have stated that many were due to motives of decency or a desire to explain obsolete words. 2. I am inclined to attribute the fact that more than two readings are never found to the paucity of exemplars perhaps not more than two or three, found by the scribes. In the treatise of the scribes, chapter 6, mention is made of three only, pretended to have been found in the time of Ezra, in order that the marginal versions might be attributed to him. However that may be, if the scribes only had three codices, we may easily imagine that in a given passage two of them would be in accord, for it would be extraordinary if each one of the three gave a different reading of the same text. The dearth of copies after the time of Ezra will surprise no one who has read the first chapter of Maccabees or Josephus's Antiquities, Book 12, Chapter 5. Nay, it appears wonderful, considering the fierce and daily persecution, that even these few should have been preserved. This will, I think, be plain to even a cursory reader of the history of those times. We have thus discovered the reasons why there are never more than two readings of a passage in the Bible. But this is a long way from supposing that we may therefore conclude that the Bible was purposely written incorrectly in such passages in order to signify some mystery. As to the second argument, that some passages are so faultily written that they are at plain variance with all grammar and should have been corrected in the text and not in the margin, I attach little weight to it. For I am not concerned to say what religious motive the scribes may have had for acting as they did, possibly they did so from candor wishing to transmit the few exemplars of the Bible which they had found exactly in their original state, marking the differences they discovered in the margin, not as doubtful readings, but as simple variants. I have myself called them doubtful readings because it would be generally impossible to say which of the two versions is preferable. Lastly, besides these doubtful readings, the scribes have, by leaving a hiatus in the middle of a paragraph, marked several passages as mutilated. The Masoretes have counted up such instances, and they amount to eight and twenty. I do not know whether any mystery is thought to lurk in the number. At any rate, the Pharisees religiously preserve a certain amount of empty space. 
one of such hiatus occurs to give an instance in genesis chapter four verse eight where it is written and cain said to his brother and when it came to pass while they were in the field etc a space being left in which we should expect to hear what it was that cain said similarly there are besides these points we have noticed eight and twenty hiatus left by the scribes many of these would not be recognized as mutilated if it were not for the empty space left but i have said enough on the subject end of section ten read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama Section 11 of A Theological-Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza Translated by Robert Harvey Munro Elvis This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 10 An Examination of the Remaining Books of the Old Testament According to the Preceding Method I now pass on to the remaining books of the Old Testament. Concerning the two books of Chronicles, I have nothing particular or important to remark, except that they were certainly written after the time of Ezra, and possibly after the restoration of the temple by Judas Maccabeus. For in chapter 9 of the first book we find a reckoning of the families who were the first to live in Jerusalem, and in verse 17 the names of the porters of which two recur in Nehemiah. This shows that the books were certainly compiled after the rebuilding of the city. As to their actual writer, their authority, utility, and doctrine, I come to no conclusion. I have always been astonished that they have been included in the Bible by men who shut out from the canon the books of wisdom, Tobit, and others style apocryphal. I do not aim at disparaging their authority, but as they are universally received, I will leave them as they are. The Psalms were collected and divided into five books in the time of the Second Temple, for Psalm 88 was published according to Philo Judaeus, while King Jehoiakim was still a prisoner in Babylon, and Psalm 89 when the same king obtained his liberty. I do not think Philo would have made the statement unless either it had been the received opinion in his time, or else had been told him by trustworthy persons. The Proverbs of Solomon were, I believe, collected at the same time, or at least in the time of King Josiah. For in chapter 25, verse 1, it is written, These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. I cannot here pass over in silence the audacity of the rabbis, who wish to exclude from the sacred canon both the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and to put them both in the Apocrypha. In fact, they would certainly have done so if they had not lighted on certain passages in which the law of Moses is extolled. It is indeed grievous to think that the settling of the sacred canon lay in the hands of such men. However, I congratulate them, in this instance, on their suffering us to see these books in question, though I cannot refrain from doubting whether they have transmitted them in absolute good faith. But I will not now linger on this point. I pass on then to the prophetic books. An examination of these assures me that the prophecies therein contained have been compiled from other books and are not always set down in the exact order in which they were spoken or written by the prophets, but are only such as were collected here and there, so that they are but fragmentary. Isaiah began to prophesy in the reign of Uzziah, as the writer himself testifies in the first verse. He not only prophesied at that time, but furthermore wrote the history of that king. See Second Chronicles chapter 26, verse 22, in a volume now lost. That which we possess we have shown to have been taken from the chronicles of the kings of Judah and Israel. I may add that the rabbis assert that this prophet prophesied in the reign of Manasseh, by whom he was eventually put to death. And although this seems to be a myth, it yet shows that they did not think that all Isaiah's prophecies are extant. The prophecies of Jeremiah, which are related historically, are also taken from various chronicles. For not only are they heaped together confusedly, without any account being taken of dates, but also the same story is told in them differently in different passages. For instance, in chapter 21 we are told that the cause of Jeremiah's arrest was that he had prophesied the destruction of the city to Zedekiah, who consulted him. 
this narrative suddenly passes in chapter twenty two to the prophet's remonstrances to jehoiakim zedekiah's predecessor and the prediction he made of that king's captivity then in chapter twenty five come the revelations granted to the prophet previously that is in the fourth year of jehoiakim and further on still the revelations received in the first year of the same reign the continuator of jeremiah goes on heaping prophecy upon prophecy without any regard to dates until at last in chapter thirty eight as if the intervening chapters had been a parenthesis he takes up the thread dropped in chapter twenty one in fact the conjunction with which chapter thirty eight begins refers to the eighth ninth and tenth verses of chapter twenty one jeremiah's last arrest is then very differently described and a totally separate cause is given for his daily retention in the court of the prison we may thus clearly see that these portions of the book have been compiled from various sources and are only from this point of view comprehensible the prophecies contained in the remaining chapters where jeremiah speaks in the first person seem to be taken from a book written by baruch at jeremiah's dictation these however only comprise as appear from chapter thirty six verse two the prophecies revealed to the prophet from the time of josiah to the fourth year of jehoiakim at which period the book begins the contents of chapter forty five verse two on to chapter fifty one verse fifty nine seem taken from the same volume that the book of ezekiel is only a fragment is clearly indicated by the first verse for any one may see that the conjunction with which it begins refers to something already said and connects what follows therewith however not only this conjunction but the whole text of the discourse implies other writings the fact of the present work beginning in the thirtieth year shows that the prophet is continuing not commencing a discourse and this is confirmed by the writer who parenthetically states in verse three the word of the lord came often unto ezekiel the priest the son of buzi in the land of the chaldeans as if to say that the prophecies which he is about to relate are the sequel to revelations formerly received by ezekiel from god furthermore josephus antiquities chapter ten verse nine says that ezekiel prophesied that zedekiah should not see babylon whereas the book we now have not only contains no such statement but contrariwise asserts in chapter seventeen that he should be taken to babylon as a captive of hosea i cannot positively state that he wrote more than is now extant in the book bearing his name but i am astonished at the smallness of the quantity we possess for the sacred writer asserts that the prophet prophesied for more than eighty years we may assert speaking generally that the compiler of the prophetic books neither collected all the prophets nor all the writings of those we have for of the prophets who are said to have prophesied in the reign of manasseh and of whom general mention is made in second chronicles chapter thirty three verses ten and eighteen we have evidently no prophecies extant neither have we all the prophecies of the twelve who give their names to books of jonah we have only the prophecy concerning the ninevites though he also prophesied to the children of israel as we learn in second kings chapter fourteen verse twenty five the book and the personality of job have caused much controversy some think that the book is the work of moses and the whole narrative merely allegorical such is the opinion of the rabbins recorded in the talmud and they are supported by maimonides in his more nebuchim others believe it to be a true history and some suppose that job lived in the time of jacob and was married to his daughter dinah aben ezra however as i have already stated affirms in his commentaries that the work is a translation into hebrew from some other language i could wish that he could advance more cogent arguments than he does for we might then conclude that the gentiles also had sacred books i myself leave the matter undecided but i conjecture job to have been a gentile and a man of very stable character who at first prospered then was assailed with terrible calamities and finally was restored to great happiness he is thus named among others by ezekiel chapter fourteen verse twelve i take it that the constancy of his mind amid the vicissitudes of his fortune occasioned many men to dispute about god's providence or at least cause a writer of the book in question to compose his dialogues for the contents and also the style seem to emanate far less from a man wretchedly ill and lying among ashes than from one reflecting at ease in his study 
I should also be inclined to agree with Aben Ezra that the book is a translation, for its poetry seems akin to that of the Gentiles. Thus the father of gods summons a council, and Momus, here called Satan, criticizes the divine decrees with the utmost freedom. But these are mere conjectures without any solid foundation. I pass on to the book of Daniel, which from chapter 8 onwards undoubtedly contains the writing of Daniel himself. Whence the first seven chapters are derived I cannot say. We may, however, conjecture that, as they were first written in Chaldean, they are taken from the Chaldean chronicles. If this could be proved, it would form a very striking proof of the fact that the sacredness of Scripture depends on our understanding of the doctrines therein signified, and not on the words, the language, and the phrases in which these doctrines are conveyed to us. And it would further show us that books which teach and speak of whatever is highest and best are equally sacred, whatever be the tongue in which they are written, or the nation to which they belong. We can, however, in this case only remark that the chapters in question were written in Chaldee, and yet are as sacred as the rest of the Bible. The first book of Ezra is so intimately connected with the book of Daniel that both are plainly recognizable as the work of the same author, writing of Jewish history from the time of the first captivity onwards. I have no hesitation in joining to this the book of Esther, for the conjunction with which it begins can refer to nothing else. It cannot be the same work as that written by Mordecai, for in chapter 9, verses 20 to 22, another person relates that Mordecai wrote letters and tells us their contents. Further, that Queen Esther confirmed the days of Purim in their times appointed, and that the decree was written in the book, that is, by a Hebraism, in a book known to all then living, which, as Aben Ezra and the rest confess, has now perished. Lastly, for the rest of the Acts of Mordecai, the historian refers us to the chronicles of the kings of Persia. Thus there is no doubt that this book was written by the same person as he who recounted the history of Daniel and Ezra, and who wrote Nehemiah's sometimes called the second book of Ezra. We may then affirm that all these books are from one hand, but we have no clue whatever to the personality of the author. However, in order to determine whence he, whoever he was, had gained a knowledge of the histories which he had, perchance, in great measure himself written, we may remark that the governors or chiefs of the Jews, after the restoration of the temple, kept scribes or historiographers who wrote annals or chronicles of them. The chronicles of the kings are often quoted in the books of kings, but the chronicles of the chiefs and priests are quoted for the first time in Nehemiah chapter 12 verse 23 and again in 1st Maccabees chapter 16 verse 24. This is undoubtedly the book referred to as containing the decree of Esther and the acts of Mordecai, and which, as we said with Aben Ezra, is now lost. From it were taken the whole contents of these four books, for no other authority is quoted by their writer or is known to us. That these books were not written by either Ezra or Nehemiah is plain from Nehemiah chapter 12 verse 9, where the descendants of the high priest Joshua are traced down to Jadua, the sixth high priest, who went to meet Alexander the Great when the Persian Empire was almost subdued. Josephus Antiquities chapter 2 verse 108 or who, according to Philo Judaeus, was the sixth and last high priest under the Persians. In the same chapter of Nehemiah, verse 22, this point is clearly brought out. The Levites in the days of Eliashib, Joiada, and Johanan, and Jadua were recorded chief of the fathers, also the priests to the reign of Darius, the Persian, that is to say, in the Chronicles. And I suppose no one thinks that the lives of Nehemiah and Ezra were so prolonged that they outlived fourteen kings of Persia. Cyrus, who was the first who granted the Jews permission to rebuild their temple, the period between his time and Darius, fourteenth and last king of Persia, extends over two hundred and thirty years. I have, therefore, no doubt that these books were written after Judas Maccabeus had restored the worship in the temple, for at that time false books of Daniel, Ezra, and Esther were published by evil-disposed persons who were almost certainly Sadducees for the writings were never recognized by the Pharisees, so far as I am aware. And although certain myths in the fourth book of Ezra are repeated in the Talmud, they must not be set down to the Pharisees, for all but the most ignorant admit that they have been added by some trifler. In fact, I think, someone must have made such additions with a view to casting ridicule on all the traditions of the sect. 
Perhaps these four books were written out and published at the time. I have mentioned with a view to showing the people that the prophecies of Daniel's had been fulfilled, and thus kindling their piety and awakening a hope of future deliverance in the midst of their misfortunes. In spite of their recent origin, the books before us contain many errors, due, I suppose, to the haste with which they were written. Marginal readings, such as I have mentioned in the last chapter, are found here as elsewhere, and in even greater abundance. There are, moreover, certain passages which can only be accounted for by supposing some such cause as hurry. However, before calling attention to the marginal readings, I will remark that, if the Pharisees are right in supposing them to have been ancient, and the work of the original scribes, we must perforce admit that these scribes, if there were more than one, set them down because they found that the text from which they were copying was inaccurate, and did yet not venture to alter what was written by their predecessors and superiors. I need not again go into the subject at length, and will therefore proceed to mention some discrepancies not noticed in the margin. 1. Some error has crept into the text of the second chapter of Ezra, for in verse 64 we are told that the total of all those mentioned in the rest of the chapter amounts to 42,360. But when we come to add up the several items, we get as result only 29,818. There must therefore be an error, either in the total or in the details. The total is probably correct, for it would most likely be well known to all as a noteworthy thing. But with the details, the case would be different. If then any error had crept into the total, it would at once have been remarked and easily corrected. This view is confirmed by Nehemiah chapter 7, where this chapter of Ezra is mentioned, and a total is given in plain correspondence thereto. But the details are altogether different. Some are larger and some less than those in Ezra, and altogether they amount to 31,089. We may therefore conclude that both in Ezra and in Nehemiah the details are erroneously given. The commentators who attempt to harmonize these evident contradictions draw on their imagination, each to the best of his ability, and while professing adoration for each letter and word of Scripture, only succeed in holding up the sacred writers to ridicule, as though they knew not how to write or relate a plain narrative. Such persons effect nothing but to render the clearness of Scripture obscure. If the Bible could everywhere be interpreted after their fashion, there would be no such thing as a rational statement on which the meaning could be relied on. However, there is no need to dwell on the subject. Only, I am convinced that if any historian were to attempt to imitate the proceedings freely attributed to the writers of the Bible, the commentators would cover him with contempt. If it be blasphemy to assert that there are any errors in Scripture, what name shall we apply to those who foist into it their own fancies, who degrade the sacred writers till they seem to write confused nonsense, and who deny the plainest and most evident meanings? What in the whole Bible can be plainer than the fact that Ezra and his companions, in the second chapter of the book attributed to him, have given in detail the reckoning of all the Hebrews who set out with them for Jerusalem? This is proved by the reckoning being given, not only of those who told their lineage, but also of those who were unable to do so. Is it not equally clear from Nehemiah chapter 7 verse 5 that the writer merely there copies the list given in Ezra? Those, therefore, who explain these passages otherwise deny the plain meaning of Scripture. Nay, they deny Scripture itself. They think it pious to reconcile one passage of Scripture with another, a pretty piety, forsooth, which accommodates the clear passages to the obscure, the correct to the faulty, the sound to the corrupt. Far be it from me to call such commentators blasphemers, if their motives be pure, for to err is human. But I return to my subject. Besides these errors in numerical detail, there are others in the genealogies, in the history, and, I fear also, in the prophecies. The prophecy of Jeremiah, chapter 22, concerning Jeconiah, evidently does not agree with his history, as given in First Chronicles, chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, and especially with the last words of the chapter. Nor do I see how the prophecy, Thou shalt die in peace, can be applied to Zedekiah, whose eyes were dug out after his sons had been slain before him. If prophecies are to be interpreted by their issue, we must make a change of name and read Jeconiah for Zedekiah and vice versa. This, however, would be too paradoxical a proceeding. So I prefer to leave the matter unexplained, especially as the error, 
if error there be, must be set down to the historian and not to any fault in the authorities. Other difficulties I will not touch upon, as I should only weary the reader, and moreover be repeating the remarks of other writers. For Rabbi Salomo, in face of the manifest contradiction in the above-mentioned genealogies, is compelled to break forth into these words. See his commentary on First Chronicles chapter 8. Ezra, whom he supposes to be the author of the book of Chronicles, gives different names and a different genealogy to the sons of Benjamin from those which we find in Genesis, and describes most of the Levites differently from Joshua, because he found original discrepancies. And again, a little later, the genealogy of Gibeon and others is described twice in different ways, from different tables of each genealogy, and in writing them down, Ezra adopted the version given in the majority of the texts, and when the authority was equal, he gave both. Thus, granting that these books were compiled from sources originally incorrect and uncertain. In fact, the commentators, in seeking to harmonize difficulties, generally do no more than indicate their causes. For I suppose no sane person supposes that the sacred historians deliberately wrote with the object of appearing to contradict themselves freely. Perhaps I shall be told that I am overthrowing the authority of Scripture, for that, according to me, anyone may suspect it of error in any passage. But, on the contrary, I have shown that my object has been to prevent the clear and uncorrupted passages being accommodated to and corrupted by the faulty ones. Neither does the fact that some passages are corrupt warrant us in suspecting all. No book ever was completely free from faults. Yet I would ask, who suspects all books to be everywhere faulty? Surely no one, especially when the phraseology is clear and the intention of the author plain. I have now finished the task I set myself with respect to the books of the Old Testament. We may easily conclude from what has been said that before the time of the Maccabees there was no canon of sacred books, but that those which we now possess were selected from a multitude of others at the period of the restoration of the temple by the Pharisees, who also instituted the set form of prayers, who are alone responsible for their acceptance. Those, therefore, who would demonstrate the authority of Holy Scripture are bound to show the authority of each separate book. It is not enough to prove the divine origin of a single book in order to infer the divine origin of the rest. In that case, we should have to assume that the Council of Pharisees was, in its choice of books, infallible, and this could never be proved. I am led to assert that the Pharisees alone selected the books of the Old Testament and inserted them in the canon, from the fact that in Daniel chapter 2 is proclaimed the doctrine of the resurrection, which the Sadducees denied. And furthermore, the Pharisees plainly assert in the Talmud that they so selected them. For in the treatise of Sabbathus, chapter 2, folio 30, page 2, it is written, Rabbi Yehuda, surnamed Rabbi, reports that the experts wish to conceal the book of Ecclesiastes because they found therein words opposed to the law, that is, to the book of the law of Moses. Why did they not hide it? Because it begins in accordance with the law and ends according to the law. And a little further on we read, they sought also to conceal the book of Proverbs. And in the first chapter of the same treatise, folio 13, page 2, Verily, name one man for good, even he who is called Nehunja, the son of Hezekiah. For, save for him, the book of Ezekiel would have been concealed, because it agreed not with the words of the law. It is thus abundantly clear that men expert in the law summoned the council to decide which books should be received into the canon and which excluded. If any man therefore wishes to be certified as to the authority of all the books, let him call a fresh council and ask every member his reasons. The time has now come for examining in the same manner the books in the New Testament. But as I learn that the task has already been performed by men highly skilled in science and languages, and as I do not myself possess a knowledge of Greek sufficiently exact for the task. Lastly, as we have lost the originals of those books which were written in Hebrew, I prefer to decline the undertaking. However, I will touch on those points which have most bearing on my subject in the following chapter. End of section 11. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 12 of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza. Translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 11. An Inquiry Whether the Apostles Wrote Their Epistles as Apostles and Prophets, or Merely as Teachers, and an Explanation of What is Meant by an Apostle. No reader of the New Testament can doubt that the Apostles were Prophets. But as a prophet does not always speak by revelation, but only at rare intervals, as we showed at the end of chapter 1, we may fairly inquire whether the apostles wrote their epistles as prophets, by revelation and express mandate, as Moses, Jeremiah, and others did, or whether only as private individuals or teachers, especially as Paul in Corinthians chapter 14 verse 6 mentions two sorts of preaching. If we examine the style of the epistles, we shall find it totally different from that employed by the prophets. The prophets are continually asserting that they speak by the command of God. Thus saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts saith, the command of the Lord, etc. And this was their habit, not only in assemblies of the prophets, but also in their epistles containing revelations, as appears from the epistle of Elijah to Jehoram, Second Chronicles chapter 21, verse 12, which begins, Thus saith the Lord. In the apostolic epistles we find nothing of the sort. Contrarywise, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 40, Paul speaks according to his own opinion, and in many passages we come across doubtful and perplexed phrases such as, We think, therefore, Romans chapter 3, verse 28, Now I think, Romans chapter 8, verse 18, and so on. Besides these, other expressions are met with very different from those used by the prophets. For instance, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6, But I speak this by permission, not by commandment. I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 25, and so on in many other passages. We must also remark that in the aforesaid chapter, the Apostle says that when he states that he has or has not the precept or commandment of God, he does not mean the precept or commandment of God revealed to himself, but only the words uttered by Christ in his Sermon on the Mount. Furthermore, if we examine the manner in which the Apostles give out evangelical doctrine, we shall see that it differs materially from the method adopted by the Prophets. The Apostles everywhere reason as if they were arguing rather than prophesying. The prophecies, on the other hand, contain only dogmas and commands. God is therein introduced not as speaking to reason, but as issuing decrees by his absolute fiat. The authority of the prophets does not submit to discussion, for whosoever wishes to find a rational ground for his arguments, by that very wish, submits them to everyone's private judgment. This Paul, inasmuch as he uses reason, appears to have done, for he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The prophets, as we showed at the end of chapter 1, did not perceive what was revealed by virtue of their natural reason, and though there are certain passages in the Pentateuch which seem to be appeals to induction, they turn out on nearer examination to be nothing but peremptory commands. For instance, when Moses says, Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 27. Behold, while I am yet alive with you, this day ye have been rebellious against the Lord, and how much more after my death. We must by no means conclude that Moses wished to convince the Israelites by reason that they would necessarily fall away from the worship of the Lord after his death. For the argument would have been false, as Scripture itself shows. The Israelites continued faithful during the lives of Joshua and the elders and afterwards during the time of Samuel, David, and Solomon. Therefore the words of Moses are merely a moral injunction, in which he predicts rhetorically the future backsliding of the people, so as to impress it vividly on their imaginations. I say that Moses spoke of himself in order to lend likelihood to his prediction, and not as a prophet by revelation, because in verse 21 of the same chapter we are told that God revealed the same thing to Moses in different words, and there was no need to make Moses certain by argument of God's prediction and decree. It was only necessary that it should be vividly impressed on his imagination, and this could not be better accomplished than by imagining the existing contumacy of the people, of which he had had frequent experience, as likely to extend into the future. 
All the arguments employed by Moses in the first five books are to be understood in a similar manner. They are not drawn from the armory of reason, but are merely modes of expression calculated to instil with efficacy and present vividly to the imagination the commands of God. However, I do not wish absolutely to deny that the prophets ever argued from revelation. I only maintain that the prophets made more legitimate use of argument in proportion as their knowledge approached more nearly to ordinary knowledge, and by this we know that they possessed a knowledge above the ordinary, inasmuch as they proclaimed absolute dogmas, decrees, or judgments. Thus Moses, the chief of the prophets, never used legitimate argument, and, on the other hand, the long deductions and arguments of Paul, such as we find in the epistle to the Romans, are in no wise written from supernatural revelation. The modes of expression and discourse adopted by the apostles in the epistles shows very clearly that the latter were not written by revelation and divine command, but merely by the natural powers and judgment of the authors. They consist in brotherly admonitions and courteous expressions such as would never be employed in prophecy, as for instance, Paul's excuse in Romans chapter 15 verse 15, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort, my brethren. We may arrive at the same conclusion from observing that we never read that the apostles were commanded to write, but only that they went everywhere preaching and confirmed their words with signs. Their personal presence and signs were absolutely necessary for the conversion and establishment in religion of the Gentiles, as Paul himself expressly states in Romans chapter 1, verse 11. But I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, to the end that ye may be established. It may be objected that we might prove in similar fashion that the apostles did not preach as prophets, for they did not go to particular places, as the prophets did, by the command of God. We read in the Old Testament that Jonah went to Nineveh to preach, and at the same time that he was expressly sent there, and told that he must preach. So also it is related at great length of Moses that he went to Egypt as a messenger of God, and was told at the same time what he should say to the children of Israel, and to King Pharaoh, and what wonders he should work before them to give credit to his words. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel were expressly commanded to preach to the Israelites. Lastly, the prophets only preached what we are assured by Scripture they had received from God, whereas this is hardly ever said of the apostles in the New Testament when they went about to preach. On the contrary, we find passages expressly implying that the apostles chose the places where they should preach on their own responsibility, for there was a difference amounting to a quarrel between Paul and Barnabas on the subject. Acts chapter 15 verses 37 and 38. Often they wished to go to a place but were prevented, as Paul writes, Romans chapter 1 verse 13. Oftentimes I purposed to come to you, but was let hitherto. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 12, as touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. From these expressions and differences of opinion among the apostles, and also from the fact that Scripture nowhere testifies of them, as of the ancient prophets, that they went by the command of God, one might conclude that they preached as well as wrote in their capacity of teachers, and not as prophets. But the question is easily solved if we observe the differences between the mission of an apostle and that of an Old Testament prophet. The latter were not called to preach and prophesy to all nations, but to certain specified ones, and therefore an express and peculiar mandate was required for each of them. The apostles, on the other hand, were called to preach to all men absolutely, and to turn all men to religion, for whithersoever they went, they were fulfilling Christ's commandment. There was no need to reveal to them beforehand what they should preach, for they were the disciples of Christ to whom their master himself said, Matthew chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. We therefore conclude that the apostles were only indebted to special revelation in what they orally preached and confirmed by signs, See the beginning of chapter 2. That which they taught in speaking or writing, without any confirmatory signs and wonders, they taught from their natural knowledge. See 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 6. 
we need not be deterred by the fact that all the epistles begin by citing the imprimatur of the apostleship for the apostles as i will shortly show were granted not only the faculty of prophecy but also the authority to teach we may therefore submit that they wrote their epistles as apostles and for this cause every one of them began by citing the apostolic imprimatur possibly with a view to gaining the attention of the reader by asserting that they were the persons who had made such mark among the faithful by their preaching and had shown by many marvellous works that they were teaching true religion and the way of salvation i observe that what is said in the epistles with regard to the apostolic vocation and the holy spirit of god which inspired them has reference to their former preaching except in those passages where the expressions of the spirit of god and the holy spirit are used to signify a pure mind upright and devoted to god for instance in first corinthians chapter seven verse forty paul says but she is happier if she so abide after my judgment and i think also that i have the spirit of god by the spirit of god the apostle here refers to his mind as we may see from the context his meaning is as follows i account blessed a widow who does not wish to marry a second husband such is my opinion for i have settled to live unmarried and i think that i am blessed there are other similar passages which i need not now quote as we have seen that the apostles wrote their epistles solely by the light of natural reason we must inquire how they were enabled to teach by natural knowledge matters outside its scope however if we bear in mind what we said in chapter seven of this treatise our difficulty will vanish for although the contents of the bible entirely surpass our understanding we may safely discourse of them provided we assume nothing not told us in scripture by the same method the apostles from what they saw and heard and from what was revealed to them were enabled to form and elicit many conclusions which they would have been able to teach to men had it been permissible further although religion as preached by the apostles does not come within the sphere of reason in so far as it consists in the narration of the life of christ yet its essence which is chiefly moral like the whole of christ's doctrine can readily be apprehended by the natural faculties of all lastly the apostles had no lack of supernatural illumination for the purpose of adapting the religion they had attested by signs to the understanding of every one so that it might be readily received nor for exhortations on the subject in fact the object of the epistles is to teach and exhort men to lead that manner of life which each of the apostles judged best for confirming them in religion we may here repeat our former remark that the apostles had received not only the faculty of preaching the history of christ as prophets and confirming it with signs but also authority for teaching and exhorting according as each thought best paul second timothy chapter one verse eleven whereunto i am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the gentiles and again first timothy chapter two verse seven whereunto i am ordained a preacher and an apostle i speak the truth in christ and lie not a teacher of the gentiles in faith and verity these passages i say show clearly the stamp both of the apostleship and the teachership the authority for admonishing whomsoever and wheresoever he pleased is asserted by paul in the epistle to philemon chapter five verse eight wherefore though i might be much bold in christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient yet etc where we may remark that if paul had received from god as a prophet what he wished to enjoin philemon and had been bound to speak in his prophetic capacity he would not have been able to change the command of god into entreaties we must therefore understand him to refer to the permission to admonish which he had received as a teacher and not as a prophet we have not yet made it quite clear that the apostles might each choose his own way of teaching but only that by virtue of their apostleship they were teachers as well as prophets however if we call reason to our aid we shall clearly see that an authority to teach implies authority to choose the method it will nevertheless be perhaps more satisfactory to draw all our proofs from scripture we are there plainly told that each apostle chose his particular method romans chapter 15 verse 20 yea so have i strived to preach the gospel not where christ was named 
lest I should build upon another man's foundation. If all the apostles had adopted the same method of teaching, and had all built up the Christian religion on the same foundation, Paul would have had no reason to call the work of a fellow apostle another man's foundation, inasmuch as it would have been identical with his own. His calling it another man's proved that each apostle built up his religious instruction on different foundations, thus resembling other teachers who have each their own method, and prefer instructing quite ignorant people who have never learnt under another master, whether the subject be science, languages, or even the indisputable truths of mathematics. Furthermore, if we go through the epistles at all attentively, we shall see that the apostles, while agreeing about religion itself, are at variance as to the foundations it rests on. Paul, in order to strengthen men's religion and show them that salvation depends solely on the grace of God, teaches that no one can boast of works but only of faith, and that no one can be justified by works. Romans chapter 3, verses 27 and 28. In fact, he preaches the complete doctrine of predestination. James, on the other hand, states that man is justified by works and not by faith only. See his epistle, chapter 2, verse 24, and omitting all the disputations of Paul, confines religion to a very few elements. Lastly, it is indisputable that from these different grounds for religion selected by the apostles, many quarrels and schisms distracted the church, even in the earliest times, and doubtless they will continue so to distract it for ever or at least till religion is separated from philosophical speculations and reduced to the few simple doctrines taught by Christ to his disciples. Such a task was impossible for the apostles, because the gospel was then unknown to mankind, and lest its novelty should offend men's ears, it had to be adapted to the disposition of contemporaries. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 and 20, and built up on the groundwork most familiar and accepted at the time. Thus none of the apostles philosophized more than did Paul, who was called to preach to the Gentiles. Other apostles, preaching to the Jews who despised philosophy, similarly adapted themselves to the temper of their hearers. See Galatians chapter 2 verse 11, and preached a religion free from all philosophical speculations. How blessed would our age be if it could witness a religion freed from all the trammels of superstition. End of section 12. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 13 of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedictus Spinoza. Translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 12 of the true original of the divine law, and wherefore scripture is called sacred, and the word of God, how that, in so far as it contains the word of God, it has come down to us uncorrupted. Those who look upon the Bible as a message sent down by God from heaven to men will doubtless cry out that I have committed the sin against the Holy Ghost, because I have asserted that the word of God is faulty, mutilated, tampered with, and inconsistent that we possess it only in fragments, and that the original of the covenant with God made with the Jews has been lost. However, I have no doubt that a little reflection will cause them to desist from their uproar. For not only reason, but the expressed opinions of prophets and apostles openly proclaim that God's eternal word and covenant, no less than true religion, is divinely inscribed in human hearts, that is, in the human mind, and that this is the true original of God's covenant, stamped with his own seal, namely, the idea of himself, as it were, with the image of his godhood. Religion was imparted to the early Hebrews as a law written down, because they were at that time in the condition of children, but afterwards Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6, and Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 33, predicted a time coming when the Lord should write his law in their hearts. Thus only the Jews, and amongst them chiefly the Sadducees, struggle for the law written on tablets. Least of all need those who bear it inscribed on their hearts join in the contest. Those, therefore, who reflect will find nothing in what I have written repugnant either to the word of God, or to true religion and faith, or calculated to weaken either one or the other. 
Contrarywise, they will see that I have strengthened religion, as I showed at the end of chapter 10. Indeed, had it not been so, I should certainly have decided to hold my peace. Nay, I would even have asserted as a way out of all difficulties that the Bible contains the most profound hidden mysteries. However, as this doctrine has given rise to gross superstition and other pernicious results spoken of at the beginning of chapter 5, I have thought such a course unnecessary, especially as religion stands in no need of superstitious adornments, but is, on the contrary, deprived by such trappings of some of her splendor. Still, it will be said, though the law of God is written in the heart, the Bible is nonetheless the word of God, and it is no more lawful to say of Scripture than of God's word that it is mutilated and corrupted. I fear that such objectors are too anxious to be pious, and that they are in danger of turning religion into superstition, and worshipping paper and ink in place of God's word. I am certified of thus much. I have said nothing unworthy of Scripture or God's word, and I have made no assertions which I could not prove by most plain argument to be true. I can therefore rest assured that I have advanced nothing which is impious or even savours of impiety. I confess that some profane men to whom religion is a burden may, from what I have said, assume a license to sin, and without any reason, at the simple dictates of their lusts, conclude that scripture is everywhere faulty and falsified, and that therefore its authority is null. But such men are beyond the reach of help. For nothing, as a proverb has it, can be said so rightly that it cannot be twisted into wrong. Those who wish to give rein to their lusts are at no loss for an excuse, nor were those men of old who possessed the original scriptures, the Ark of the Covenant, nay, the prophets and apostles in persons among them, any better than the people of today. Human nature, Jew as well as Gentile, has always been the same, and in every age virtue has been exceedingly rare. Nevertheless, to remove every scruple, I will here show in what sense the Bible or any inanimate thing should be called sacred and divine, also wherein the law of God consists, and how it cannot be contained in a certain number of books. And lastly, I will show that Scripture, in so far as it teaches what is necessary for obedience and salvation, cannot have been corrupted. From these considerations, every one will be able to judge that I have neither said anything against the word of God, nor given any foothold to impiety. A thing is called sacred and divine when it is designed for promoting piety, and continues sacred so long as it is religiously used. If the users cease to be pious, the thing ceases to be sacred. If it be turned to base uses, that which was formerly sacred becomes unclean and profane. For instance, a certain spot was named by the patriarch Jacob, the house of God, because he worshipped God there revealed to him. By the prophets, the same spot was called the house of iniquity. See Amos chapter 5 verse 5 and Hosea chapter 10 verse 5, because the Israelites were wont at the instigation of Jeroboam to sacrifice there to idols. Another example puts the matter in the plainest light. Words gain their meaning solely from their usage and if they are arranged according to their accepted signification, so as to move those who read them to devotion, they will become sacred, and the books so written will be sacred also. But if their usage afterwards dies out so that the words have no meaning, or the book becomes utterly neglected, whether from unworthy motives or because it is no longer needed, then the words and the book will lose both their use and their sanctity. Lastly, if these same words be otherwise arranged, or if their customary meaning becomes perverted into its opposite, then both the words and the book containing them become, instead of sacred, impure and profane. For this it follows that nothing is in itself absolutely sacred or profane and unclean, apart from the mind, but only relatively thereto. Thus much is clear from many passages in the Bible. Jeremiah, to select one case out of many, says, chapter 7, verse 4, that the Jews of his time were wrong in calling Solomon's temple the temple of God, for, as he goes on to say in the same chapter, God's name would only be given to the temple so long as it was frequented by men who worshipped him and defended justice, but that, if it became the resort of murderers, thieves, idolaters, and other wicked persons, it would be turned into a den of malefactors. Scripture, curiously enough, nowhere tells us what became of the Ark of the Covenant, 
though there is no doubt that it was destroyed or burnt together with the temple yet there was nothing which the hebrews considered more sacred or held in greater reverence thus scripture is sacred and its words divine so long as it stirs mankind to devotion towards god but if it be utterly neglected as it formerly was by the jews it becomes nothing but paper and ink and is left to be desecrated or corrupted still though scripture be thus corrupted or destroyed we must not say that the word of god has suffered in like manner else we shall be like the jews who said that the temple which would then be the temple of god had perished in the flames jeremiah tells us this in respect to the law for he thus chides the ungodly of his time wherefore say you we are masters and the law of the lord is with us surely it has been given in vain it is in vain that the pen of the scribes has been made that is you say falsely that the scripture is in your power and that you possess the law of god for ye have made it of none effect so also when moses broke the first tables of the law he did not by any means cast the word of god from his hands in anger and shatter it such an action would be inconceivable either of moses or of god's word he only broke the tables of stone which though they had before been holy from containing the covenant wherewith the jews had bound themselves in obedience to god had entirely lost their sanctity when the covenant had been violated by the worship of the calf and were therefore as liable to perish as the ark of the covenant it is thus scarcely to be wondered at that the original documents of moses are no longer extant nor that the books we possess met with the fate we have described when we consider that the true original of the divine covenant the most sacred object of all has totally perished let them cease therefore who accuse us of impiety inasmuch as we have said nothing against the word of god neither have we corrupted it but let them keep their anger if they would wreak it justly for the ancients whose malice desecrated the ark the temple and the law of god and all that was held sacred subjecting them to corruption furthermore if according to the saying of the apostle in second corinthians chapter three verse three they possessed the epistle of christ written not with ink but with the spirit of the living god not in tables of stone but in the fleshy tables of the heart let them cease to worship the letter and be so anxious concerning it i think i would have now sufficiently shown in what respect scripture should be accounted sacred and divine we may now see what should rightly be understood by the expression the word of the lord debar the hebrew original signifies word speech command and thing the causes for which a thing is in hebrew said to be of god or is referred to him have been already detailed in chapter one and we can therefore easily gather what meaning scripture attaches to the phrases the word the speech the command or the thing of god i need not therefore repeat what i there said nor what was shown under the third head in the chapter on miracles it is enough to mention the repetitions for the better understanding of what i am about to say viz that the word of the lord when it has a reference to any one but god himself signifies that divine law treated of in chapter four in other words religion universal and catholic to the whole human race as isaiah describes it chapter one verse ten teaching that the true way of life consists not in ceremonies but in charity and a true heart and calling it indifferently god's law and god's word the expression is also used metaphorically for the order of nature and destiny which indeed actually depend and follow from the eternal mandate of the divine nature and especially for such parts of such order as were foreseen by the prophets for the prophets did not perceive future events as a result of natural causes but as the fiats and decrees of god lastly it is employed for the command of any prophet in so far as he had perceived it by his peculiar faculty or prophetic gift and not by the natural light of reason this use springs chiefly from the usual prophetic conception of god as a legislator which we remarked in chapter four there are then three causes for the bible's being called the word of god because it teaches true religion of which god is the eternal founder because it narrates predictions of future events as though they were decrees of god because its actual authors generally perceived things not by their ordinary natural faculties but by a power peculiar to themselves 
and introduced these things perceived as told them by God. Although scriptures contains much that is merely historical, and can be perceived by natural reason, yet its name is acquired from its chief subject matter. We can thus easily see how God can be said to be the author of the Bible. It is because of the true religion therein contained, and not because he wished to communicate to men a certain number of books. We can also learn from hence the reason for the division into Old and New Testament. It was made because the prophets who preached religion before Christ preached it as a national law in virtue of the covenant entered into under Moses, while the apostles who came after Christ preached it to all men as a universal religion solely in virtue of Christ's passion. The cause for the division is not that the two parts are different in doctrine, nor that they were written as originals of the covenant, nor, lastly, that the Catholic religion, which is in entire harmony with our nature, was new except in relation to those who had not known it. It was in the world, as John the Evangelist says, and the world knew it not. Thus, even if we had fewer books of the Old and New Testament than we have, we should still not be deprived of the word of God, which, as we have said, is identical with true religion, even as we do not now hold ourselves to be deprived of it, though we lack many cardinal writings such as the Book of the Law, which was religiously guarded in the temple as the original of the covenant, also the Book of Wars, the Book of Chronicles, and many others, from whence the extant Old Testament was taken and compiled. The above conclusion may be supported by many reasons. One, because the books of both testaments were not written by express command at one place for all ages, but are a fortuitous collection of the works of men, writing each as his period and disposition dictated. So much is clearly shown by the call of the prophets, who were bed to admonish the ungodly of their time, and also by the apostolic epistles. Two, because it is one thing to understand the meaning of Scripture and the prophets, and quite another thing to understand the meaning of God or the actual truth. This follows from what we said in chapter 2. We showed in chapter 6 that it applied to historic narratives and to miracles, but it by no means applies to questions concerning true religion and virtue. 3. Because the books of the Old Testament were selected from many and were collected and sanctioned by a council of the Pharisees, as we showed in chapter 10, the books of the New Testament were also chosen from many by councils which are rejected as spurious other books held sacred by many. But these councils, both Pharisee and Christian, were not composed of prophets, but only of learned men and teachers. Still, we must grant that they were guided in their choice by a regard for the word of God, and they must therefore have known what the law of God was. For, because the apostles wrote not as prophets, but as teachers, see last chapter, and chose whatever method they thought best adapted for those whom they addressed, and consequently, there are many things in the epistles, as we showed at the end of the last chapter, which are not necessary to salvation. 5. Because there are four evangelists in the New Testament, and it is scarcely credible that God can have designed to narrate the life of Christ four times over, and to communicate it thus to mankind. For though there are some details related in one gospel which are not in another, and one often helps us to understand another, we cannot thence conclude that all that is set down is of vital importance to us, and that God chose the four evangelists in order that the life of Christ might be better understood. For each one preached his gospel in a separate locality, each wrote it down as he preached it, in simple language, in order that the history of Christ might be clearly told, not with any view of explaining his fellow evangelists. If there are some passages which can be better and more easily understood by comparing the various versions they are the result of chance, and are not numerous. Their continuance in obscurity would have impaired neither the clearness of the narrative nor the blessedness of mankind. We have now shown that Scripture can only be called the Word of God in so far as it affects religion or the divine law. We must now point out that in respect to these questions it is neither faulty, tampered with, nor corrupt. By faulty, tampered with, and corrupt, I here mean written so incorrectly that the meaning cannot be arrived at by a study of the language, nor from the authority of Scripture. I will not go to such lengths as to say that the Bible, in so far as it contains the divine law, has always preserved the same vowel points, the same letters, or the same words. 
I leave this to be proved by the Massoretes and other worshippers of the letter. I only maintain that the meaning by which alone an utterance is entitled to be called divine has come down to us uncorrupted, even though the original wording may have been more often changed than we suppose. Such alterations, as I have said above, detract nothing from the divinity of the Bible, for the Bible would have been no less divine had it been written in different words or a different language. That the divine law has in this sense come down to us uncorrupted is an assertion which admits of no dispute. For from the Bible itself we learn, without the smallest difficulty or ambiguity, that its cardinal precept is to love God above all things and one's neighbor as oneself. This cannot be a spurious passage, nor due to a hasty and mistaken scribe, for if the Bible had ever put forth a different doctrine, it would have had to change the whole of its teaching, for this is the cornerstone of religion, without which the whole fabric would fall headlong to the ground. The Bible would not be the work we have been examining, but something quite different. We remain then unshaken in our belief that this has always been the doctrine of Scripture, and consequently that no error sufficient to vitiate it can have crept in without being instantly observed by all, nor can any one have succeeded in tampering with it and escape the discovery of his malice. As this cornerstone is intact, we must perforce admit the same of whatever other passages are indisputably dependent on it, and are also fundamental, as for instance that a God exists, that he foresees all things, and that he is almighty, that by his decree the good prosper and the wicked come to naught, and finally, that our salvation depends solely on his grace. These are doctrines which Scripture plainly teaches throughout, and which it is bound to teach, else all the rest would be empty and baseless. Nor can we be less positive about other moral doctrines which plainly are built upon this universal foundation. For instance, to uphold justice, to aid the weak, to do no murder, to covet no man's goods, etc. Precepts, I repeat, such as these, human malice and the lapse of ages are alike powerless to destroy. For if any part of them perished, its loss would immediately be supplied from the fundamental principle, especially the doctrine of charity, which is everywhere in both testaments extolled above all others. Moreover, though it be true that there is no conceivable crime so heinous that it has never been committed, still there is no one who would attempt an excuse for his crimes to destroy the law, or introduce an impious doctrine in the place of what is eternal and salutary. Men's nature is so constituted that every one, be he king or subject, who has committed a base action, tries to deck out his conduct with spurious excuses, till he seems to have done nothing but what is just and right. We may conclude, therefore, that the whole divine law as taught by Scripture has come down to us uncorrupted. Besides this, there are certain facts which we may be sure have been transmitted in good faith. For instance, the main facts of Hebrew history, which were perfectly well known to every one. The Jewish people were accustomed in former times to chant the ancient history of their nation in Psalms. The main facts also of Christ's life and passion were immediately spread abroad through the whole Roman Empire. It is therefore scarcely credible, unless nearly everybody consented thereto, which we cannot suppose, that successive generations have handed down the broad outline of the gospel narrative otherwise than as they received it. Whatsoever, therefore, is spurious or faulty can only have reference to details. Some circumstances in one or the other history or prophecy designed to stir the people to greater devotion, or in some miracle with the view of confounding philosophers, or lastly in speculative matters after they had become mixed up with religion, so that some individual might prop up his own inventions with a pretext of divine authority. But such matters have little to do with salvation, whether they be corrupted, little or much, as I will show in detail in the next chapter, though I think the question sufficiently plain from what I have already said, especially in chapter 2. End of section 13, read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 14 of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza, translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 13. It is shown that Scripture teaches only very simple doctrines, such as suffice for right conduct. In the second chapter of this treatise, we pointed out that the prophets were gifted with extraordinary powers of imagination, 
but not of understanding also that god only revealed to them such things as are very simple not philosophical mysteries and that he adapted his communications to their previous opinions we further showed in chapter five that scripture only transmits and teaches truths which can readily be comprehended by all not deducing and concatenating its conclusions from definitions and axioms but narrating quite simply and confirming its statements with a view to inspiring belief by an appeal to experience as exemplified in miracles and history and setting forth its truth in the style and phraseology which would most appeal to the popular mind refer chapter six third division lastly we demonstrated in chapter seven that the difficulty of understanding scripture lies in the language only and not in the abstruseness of the argument to these considerations we may add that the prophets did not preach only to the learned but to all jews without exception while the apostles were wont to teach the gospel doctrine in churches where there were public meetings whence it follows that scriptural doctrine contains no lofty speculations nor philosophic reasoning but only very simple matters such as could be understood by the slowest intelligence i am consequently lost in wonder at the ingenuity of those whom i have already mentioned who detect in the bible mysteries so profound that they cannot be explained in human language and who have introduced so many philosophic speculations into religion that the church seems like an academy and religion like a science or rather a dispute it is not to be wondered at that men who boast of possessing supernatural intelligence should be unwilling to yield the palm of knowledge to philosophers who have only their ordinary faculties still i should be surprised if i found them teaching any new speculative doctrine which was not a commonplace to those gentile philosophers whom in spite of all they stigmatize as blind for if one inquire what these mysteries lurking in scripture may be one is confronted with nothing but the reflections of plato or aristotle or the like which it would often be easier for an ignorant man to dream than for the most accomplished scholar to wrest out of the bible however i do not wish to affirm absolutely that scripture contains no doctrines in the sphere of philosophy for in the last chapter i pointed out some of the kind as fundamental principles but i go so far as to say that such doctrines are very few and very simple their precise nature and definition i will now set forth the task will be easy for we know that scripture does not aim at imparting scientific knowledge and therefore it demands from men nothing but obedience and censures obstinacy but not ignorance furthermore as obedience to god consists solely in love to our neighbor for whosoever loveth his neighbor as a means of obeying god hath as saint paul says romans chapter 13 verse 8 fulfill the law it follows that no knowledge is commended in the bible save that which is necessary for enabling all men to obey god in the manner stated and without which they would become rebellious or without the discipline of obedience other speculative questions which have no direct bearing on the object or are concerned with the knowledge of natural events do not affect scripture and should be entirely separated from religion now though every one as we have said is now quite able to see this truth for himself i should nevertheless wish considering that the whole of religion depends thereon to explain the entire question more accurately and clearly to this end i must first prove that the intellectual or accurate knowledge of god is not a gift bestowed upon all good men like obedience and further that the knowledge of god required by him through his prophets from every one without exception as needful to be known is simply a knowledge of his divine justice and charity both these points are easily proved from scripture the first plainly follows from exodus chapter six verse two where god in order to show the singular grace bestowed upon moses says to him and i appeared unto abraham unto isaac and unto jacob by the name of el sadai av god almighty but by my name jehovah was i not known to them for the better understanding of which passage i may remark that el shaddai in hebrew signifies the god who suffices in that he gives to every man that which suffices for him and although shaddai is often used by itself to signify god we cannot doubt that the word el god is everywhere understood furthermore we must note that jehovah is the only word found in scripture with the meaning of the absolute essence of god without reference to created things 
the jews maintain for this reason that this is strictly speaking the only name of god that the rest of the words used are merely titles and in truth the other names of god whether they be substantives or adjectives are merely attributive and belong to him in so far as he is conceived of in relation to created things or manifested through them thus el or eloa signifies powerful as is well known and only applies to god in respect to his supremacy as when we call paul an apostle the faculties of his power are set forth in an accompanying adjective as el great awful just merciful etc or else all are understood at once by the use of el in the plural number with a singular signification an expression frequently adopted in scripture now as god tells moses that he was not known to the patriarchs by the name of jehovah it follows that they were not cognizant of any attribute of god which expresses his absolute essence but only of his deeds and promises that is of his power as manifested in visible things god does not speak to moses in order to accuse the patriarchs of infidelity but on the contrary as a means of extolling their belief and faith inasmuch as though they possessed no extraordinary knowledge of god such as moses had they yet accepted his promises as fixed and certain whereas moses though his thoughts about god were more exalted nevertheless doubted about the divine promises and complained to god that instead of the promised deliverance the prospects of the israelites had darkened as the patriarchs did not know the distinctive name of god and as god mentions the fact to moses in praise of their faith and single-heartedness and in contrast to the extraordinary grace granted to moses it follows as we stated at first that men are not bound by decree to have knowledge of the attributes of god such knowledge being only granted to a few of the faithful it is hardly worth while to quote further examples from scripture for every one must recognize that knowledge of god is not equal among all good men moreover a man cannot be ordered to be wise any more than he can be ordered to live and exist men women and children are all alike able to obey by commandment but not to be wise if any tell us that it is not necessary to understand the divine attributes but that we must believe them simply without proof he is plainly trifling for what is invisible and can only be perceived by the mind cannot be apprehended by any other means than proofs if these are absent the object remains ungrasped the repetition of what has been heard on such subjects no more indicates or attains to their meaning than the words of a parrot or a puppet speaking without sense or signification before i proceed i ought to explain how it comes that we are often told in genesis that the patriarchs preached in the name of jehovah this being in plain contradiction to the text above quoted a reference to what was said in chapter eight will readily explain the difficulty it was there shown that the writer of the pentateuch did not always speak of things and places by the names they bore in the times of which he was writing but by the names best known to his contemporaries god is thus said in the pentateuch to have been preached by the patriarchs under the name of jehovah not because such was the name by which the patriarchs knew him but because this name was the one most reverenced by the jews this point i say must necessarily be noticed for in exodus it is expressly stated that god was not known to the patriarchs by this name and in chapter three verse thirteen it is said that moses desired to know the name of god now if this name had been already known it would have been known to moses we must therefore draw the conclusions indicated namely that the faithful patriarchs did not know this name of god and that the knowledge of god is bestowed and not commanded by the deity it is now time to pass on to our second point and show that god through his prophets required from men no other knowledge of himself than is contained in a knowledge of his justice and charity that is of attributes which a certain manner of life will enable men to imitate jeremiah states this in so many words chapter twenty two verses fifteen and sixteen did not thy father eat and drink and do judgment and justice and then it was well with him he judged the cause of the poor and needy when it was well with him was not this to know me saith the lord the words in chapter nine verse twenty four of the same book are equally clear but let him that glorieth glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me that i am the lord which exercise loving kindness judgment and righteousness in the earth for in these things i delight saith the lord the same doctrine may be gathered from exodus chapter thirty four verse six where god revealed to moses only those of his attributes which display the divine justice and charity 
Lastly, we may call attention to a passage in John, which we shall discuss at more length hereafter. The Apostle explains the nature of God, inasmuch as no one has beheld Him, through charity only, and concludes that he who possesses charity possesses, and in very truth knows God. We have thus seen that Moses, Jeremiah, and John sum up in a very short compass the knowledge of God needful for all, and that they state it to consist in exactly what we said, namely, that God is supremely just and supremely merciful, in other words, the one perfect pattern of the true life. We may add that Scripture nowhere gives an express definition of God and does not point out any other of His attributes which should be apprehended, save these, nor does it in set terms praise any others. Wherefore, we may draw the general conclusion that an intellectual knowledge of God, which takes cognizance of His nature, in so far as it actually is, and which cannot by any manner of living be imitated by mankind or followed as an example, has no bearing whatever on true rules of conduct, on faith, or on revealed religion. Consequently, that men may be in complete error on the subject without incurring the charge of sinfulness. We need now no longer wonder that God adapted himself to the existing opinions and imaginations of the prophets, or that the faithful held different ideas of God, as we showed in chapter 2, or again, that the sacred books speak very inaccurately of God, attributing to him hands, feet, eyes, ears, a mind, and motion from one place to another, or that they ascribe to him emotions such as jealousy, mercy, etc., or lastly, that they describe him as a judge in heaven, sitting on a royal throne with Christ on his right hand. Such expressions are adapted to the understanding of the multitude, it being the object of the Bible to make men not learned but obedient. In spite of this, the general run of theologians, when they come upon any of these phrases which they cannot rationally harmonize with the divine nature, maintain that they should be interpreted metaphorically. Passages that they cannot understand, they say, should be interpreted literally. But if every expression of this kind in the Bible is necessarily to be interpreted and understood metaphorically, Scripture must have been written, not for the people and the unlearned masses, but chiefly for accomplished experts and philosophers. If it were indeed a sin to hold piously and simply the ideas about God we have just quoted, the prophets ought to have been strictly on their guard against the use of such expressions seeing the weak-mindedness of the people, and ought, on the other hand, to have set forth, first of all, duly and clearly those attributes of God which are needful to be understood. This they have nowhere done. We cannot therefore think that opinions are taken in themselves without respect to actions are either pious or impious, but must maintain that a man is pious or impious in his beliefs only, in so far as he is thereby incited to obedience, or derives from them license to sin and rebel. If a man, by believing what is true, becomes rebellious, his creed is impious. If by believing what is false, he becomes obedient, his creed is pious. For the true knowledge of God comes not by commandment, but by divine gift. God has required nothing from man but a knowledge of his divine justice and charity, and that not as necessary to scientific accuracy, but to obedience. End of section 14. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 15 of a Theologico-Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza. Translated by Robert Harvey Munro Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 14. Definitions of Faith, the Faith, and the Foundations of Faith, which is once for all separated from philosophy. For a true knowledge of faith, it is above all things necessary to understand that the Bible was adapted to the intelligence not only of the prophets, but also of the diverse and fickle Jewish multitude. This will be recognized by all who give any thought to the subject, for they will see that a person who accepted promiscuously everything in Scripture as being the universal and absolute teaching of God, without accurately defining what was adapted to the proper intelligence, would find it impossible to escape confounding the opinions of the masses with the divine doctrines, praising the judgments and comments of man as the teaching of God, and making a wrong use of scriptural authority. Who, I say, does not perceive that this is the chief reason why so many sectaries teach contradictory opinions as divine documents, and support their contentions with numerous scriptural texts, till it has passed in Belgium into a proverb, 
Gien Keter Sonder Letter, No Heretic Without a Text. The sacred books were not written by one man, nor for the people of a single period, but by many authors of different temperaments, at times extending from first to last over nearly two thousand years, and perhaps much longer. We will not, however, accuse the sectaries of impiety, because they have adapted the words of Scripture to their own opinions. It is thus that these words were adapted to the understanding of the masses originally, and every one is at liberty so to treat them. If he sees that he can thus obey God in matters relating to justice and charity with a more full consent, but we do accuse those who will not grant this freedom to their fellows, but who persecute all who differ from them as God's enemies, however honourable and virtuous be their lives, while on the other hand they cherish those who agree with them, however foolish they may be, as God's elect. Such conduct is as wicked and dangerous to the state as any that can be conceived. In order, therefore, to establish the limits to which individual freedom should extend, and to decide what persons, in spite of the diversity of their opinions, are to be looked upon as the faithful, we must define faith and its essentials. This task I hope to accomplish in the present chapter, and also to separate faith from philosophy, which is the chief aim of the whole treatise. In order to proceed duly to the demonstration, let us recapitulate the chief aim and object of Scripture. This will indicate a standard by which we may define faith. We have said in a former chapter that the aim and object of Scripture is only to teach obedience. Thus much, I think, no one can question. Who does not see that both testaments are nothing else but schools for this object, and have neither of them any aim beyond inspiring mankind with a voluntary obedience? For, not to repeat what I have said in the last chapter, I will remark that Moses did not seek to convince the Jews by reason, but bound them by a covenant, by oaths, and by conferring benefits. Further, he threatened the people with punishment if they should infringe the law, and promised rewards if they should obey it. All these are not means for teaching knowledge, but for inspiring obedience. The doctrine of the Gospels enjoins nothing but simple faith, namely to believe in God and to honour Him, which is the same thing as to obey Him. There is no occasion for me to throw further light on a question so plain by citing scriptural texts commending obedience, such as may be found in great numbers in both Testaments. Moreover, the Bible teaches very clearly in a great many passages what every one ought to do in order to obey God. The whole duty is summed up in love to one's neighbour. It cannot therefore be denied that he who by God's command loves his neighbour as himself is truly obedient and blessed, according to the law, whereas he who hates his neighbour or neglects him is rebellious and obstinate. Lastly, it is plain to every one that the Bible was not written and disseminated only for the learned, but for men of every age and race. Wherefore, we may rest assured that we are not bound by scriptural command to believe anything beyond what is absolutely necessary for fulfilling its main precept. This precept, then, is the only standard of the whole Catholic faith, and by it alone all the dogmas needful to be believed should be determined. So much being abundantly manifest, as is also the fact that all other doctrines of the faith can be legitimately deduced therefrom by reason alone. I leave it to every man to decide for himself how it comes to pass that so many divisions have arisen in the church. Can it be from any other cause than those suggested at the beginning of chapter 7? It is these same causes which compel me to explain the method of determining the dogmas of the faith from the foundation we have discovered, for if I neglected to do so, and put the question on a regular basis, I might justly be said to have promised too lavishly, for that any one might, by my showing, introduce any doctrine he liked into religion, under the pretext that it was a necessary means to obedience, especially would this be the case in question respecting the divine attributes. In order, therefore, to set forth the whole matter methodically, I will begin with a definition of faith, which on the principle above given should be as follows. Faith consists in a knowledge of God, without which obedience to Him would be impossible, and which the mere fact of obedience to Him implies. This definition is so clear, and follows so plainly from what we have already proved, that it needs no explanation. The consequences involved therein I will now briefly show. 1. Faith is not salutary in itself, but only in respect to the obedience it implies, or as James puts it in his epistle, chapter 2, verse 17, faith without works is dead. See the whole of the chapter quoted. 2. He who is truly obedient necessarily possesses true and saving faith. 
for if obedience be granted, faith must be granted also, as the same apostle expressly says in these words. Chapter 2, verse 18. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So also John, first epistle, chapter 4, verse 7. Every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. From these texts, I repeat, it follows, that we can only judge a man faithful or unfaithful by his works. If his works be good, he is faithful, however much his doctrines may differ from those of the rest of the faithful. If his works be evil, though he may verbally conform, he is unfaithful. For obedience implies faith, and faith without works is dead. John, in the thirteenth verse of the chapter above quoted, expressly teaches the same doctrine. Hereby, he says, Know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit, that is, love. He had said before that God is love, and therefore he concludes on his own received principles, that whoso possesses love possesses truly the spirit of God. As no one has beheld God, he infers that no one has knowledge or consciousness of God, except from love towards his neighbor, and also that no one can have knowledge of any of God's attributes except this of love, in so far as we participate therein. If these arguments are not conclusive, they at any rate show the Apostle's meaning, but the words in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 of the same epistle are much clearer. For they state in so many words our precise contentions, and hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. From all this, I repeat, it follows, that they are the true enemies of Christ, who persecute honourable and justice-loving men, because they differ from them, and do not uphold the same religious dogmas as themselves. For whosoever loves justice and charity we know, by that very fact, to be faithful. Whosoever persecutes the faithful is an enemy to Christ. Lastly, it follows that faith does not demand that dogmas should be true, as that they should be pious, that is, such as will stir up the heart to obey. Though there be many such which contain not a shadow of truth, so long as they be held in good faith, otherwise their adherents are disobedient. For how can any one, desirous of loving justice and obeying God, adore as divine what he knows to be alien from the divine nature? However, men may err from simplicity of mind, and Scripture, as we have seen, does not condemn ignorance but obstinacy. This is the necessary result of our definition of faith, and all its branches should spring from the universal rule above given, and from the evident aim and object of the Bible, unless we choose to mix our own inventions therewith. Thus it is not true doctrines which are expressly required by the Bible, so much as doctrines necessary for obedience, and to confirm in our hearts the love of our neighbour, wherein, to adopt the words of John, we are in God, and God in us. As then, each man's faith must be judged pious or impious, only in respect of its producing obedience or obstinacy, and not in respect of its truth, and as no one will dispute that men's dispositions are exceedingly varied, that all do not acquiesce in the same things, but are ruled some by one opinion, some by another, so that what moves one to devotion moves another to laughter and contempt. It follows that there can be no doctrine in the Catholic or universal religion which can give rise to controversy among good men. Such doctrines might be pious to some and impious to others, whereas they should be judged solely by their fruits. To the universal religion, then, belongs only such dogmas as are absolutely required in order to attain obedience to God, and without which such obedience would be impossible. As for the rest, each man, seeing that he is the best judge of his own character, should adopt whatever he thinks best adapted to strengthen his love of justice. If this were so, I think there would be no further occasion for controversies in the church. I have now no further fear in enumerating the dogmas of universal faith or the fundamental dogmas of the whole of Scripture, inasmuch as they all tend, as may be seen from what has been said, to this one doctrine, namely, that there exists a God, that is, a supreme being, who loves justice and charity, and who must be obeyed by whosoever would be saved. That the worship of this being consists in the practice of justice and love towards one's neighbour, and that they contain nothing beyond the following doctrines. 1. That God or a supreme being exists 
sovereignly just and merciful the exemplar of the true life that whosoever is ignorant of or disbelieves in his existence cannot obey him or know him as a judge two that he is one nobody will dispute that this doctrine is absolutely necessary for entire devotion admiration and love towards god for devotion admiration and love spring from the superiority of one over all else three that he is omnipresent or that all things are open to him for if anything could be supposed to be concealed from him or to be unnoticed by him we might doubt or be ignorant of the equity of his judgment as directing all things four that he has supreme right and dominion over all things and that he does nothing under compulsion but by his absolute fiat and grace all things are bound to obey him he is not bound to obey any five that the worship of god consists only in justice and charity or love towards one's neighbour six that all those and those only who obey god by their manner of life are saved the rest of mankind who live under the sway of their pleasures are lost if we did not believe this there would be no reason for obeying god rather than pleasure seven lastly that god forgives the sins of those who repent no one is free from sin so that without this belief all would despair of salvation and there would be no reason for believing in the mercy of god he who firmly believes that god out of the mercy and grace with which he directs all things forgives the sins of men and who feels his love of god kindled thereby he i say does really know christ according to the spirit and christ is in him no one can deny that all these doctrines are before all things necessary to be believed in order that every man without exception may be able to obey god according to the bidding of the law above explained for if one of these precepts be disregarded obedience is destroyed but as to what god or the exemplar of the true life may be whether fire or spirit or light or thought or what not this i say has nothing to do with faith any more than has the question how he comes to be the exemplar of the true life whether it be because he has a just and merciful mind or because all things exist and act through him and consequently that we understand through him and through him see what is truly just and good every one may think on such questions as he likes furthermore faith is not affected whether we hold that god is omnipresent essentially or potentially that he directs all things by absolute fiat or by the necessity of his nature that he dictates laws like a prince or that he sets them forth as eternal truths that man obeys him by virtue of free will or by virtue of the necessity of the divine decree lastly that the reward of the good and the punishment of the wicked is natural or supernatural these and such like questions have no bearing on faith except in so far as they are used as means to give us license to sin more or to obey god less i will go further and maintain that every man is bound to adapt these dogmas to his own way of thinking and to interpret them according as he feels that he can give them his fullest and most unhesitating assent so that he may the more easily obey god with his whole heart such was the manner as we have already pointed out in which the faith was in old time revealed and written in accordance with the understanding and opinions of the prophets and people of the period so in like fashion every man is bound to adapt it to his own opinion so that he may accept it without any hesitation or mental repugnance we have shown that faith does not so much require truth as piety and that it is only quickening and pious through obedience consequently no one is faithful save by obedience alone the best faith is not necessarily possessed by him who displays the best reasons but by him who displays the best fruits of justice and charity how salutary and necessary this doctrine is for a state in order that men may dwell together in peace and concord and how many and how great causes of disturbance and crime are thereby cut off i leave every one to judge for himself before we go further i may remark that we can by means of what we have just proved easily answer the objections raised in chapter one when we were discussing god's speaking with the israelites on mount sinai for though the voice heard by the israelites could not give these men any philosophical or mathematical certitude of god's existence it was yet sufficient to thrill them with admiration for god as they already knew him and to stir them up to obedience and such was the object of the display god did not wish to teach the israelites the absolute attributes of his essence none of which he then revealed 
but to break down their hardness of heart and to draw them to obedience therefore he did not appeal to them with reason but with the sound of trumpets thunder and lightnings it remains for me to show that between faith or theology and philosophy there is no connection nor affinity i think no one will dispute the fact who has knowledge of the aim and foundations of the two subjects for they are as wide apart as the poles philosophy has no end in view save truth faith as we have abundantly proved looks for nothing but obedience and piety again philosophy is based on axioms which must be sought from nature alone faith is based on history and language and must be sought for only in scripture and revelation as we showed in chapter seven faith therefore allows the greatest latitude in philosophic speculation allowing us without blame to think what we like about anything and only condemning as heretics and schismatics those who teach opinions which tend to produce obstinacy hatred strife and anger while on the other hand only considering as faithful those who persuade us as far as their reason and faculties will permit to follow justice and charity lastly as what we are now setting forth are the most important subjects of my treatise i would most urgently beg the reader before i proceed to read these two chapters with especial attention and to take the trouble to weigh them well in his mind let him take for granted that i have not written with a view to introducing novelties but in order to do away with abuses such as i hope i may at some future time at last see reformed end of section fifteen read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama Section 16 of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza. Translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 15. Theology is shown not to be subservient to reason, nor reason to theology. A definition of the reason which enables us to accept the authority of the Bible. Those who know not that philosophy and reason are distinct, dispute whether scripture should be made subservient to reason or reason to scripture that is whether the meaning of scripture should be made to agreed with reason or whether reason should be made to agree with scripture the latter position is assumed by the skeptics who deny the certitude of reason the former by the dogmatists both parties are as i have shown utterly in the wrong for either doctrine would require us to tamper with reason or with scripture we have shown that scripture does not teach philosophy but merely obedience and that all it contains has been adapted to the understanding and established opinions of the multitude those therefore who wish to adapt it to philosophy must needs ascribe to the prophets many ideas which they never dreamed of and give an extremely forced interpretation to their words those on the other hand who would make reason and philosophy subservient to theology will be forced to accept as divine utterances the prejudices of the ancient jews and to fill and confuse their mind therewith in short one party will run wild with the aid of reason and the other will run wild without the aid of reason the first among the pharisees who openly maintained that scripture should be made to agree with reason was maimonides whose opinion we reviewed and abundantly refuted in chapter seven now although this writer had much authority among his contemporaries he was deserted on this question by almost all and the majority went straight over to the opinion of a certain rabbi yehuda alpachar who in his anxiety to avoid the error of maimonides fell into another which was its exact contrary he held that reason should be made subservient and entirely give way to scripture he thought that a passage should not be interpreted metaphorically simply because it was repugnant to reason but only in the cases when it is inconsistent with scripture itself that is with its clear doctrines therefore he laid down the universal rule that whatsoever scripture teaches dogmatically and affirms expressly must on its own sole authority be admitted as absolutely true that there is no doctrine in the bible which directly contradicts the general tenor of the whole but only some which appear to involve a difference for the phrases of scripture often seem to imply something contrary to what has been expressly taught such phrases and such phrases only we may interpret metaphorically for instance scripture clearly teaches the unity of god see deuteronomy chapter six verse four nor is there any text distinctly asserting a plurality of gods but in several passages god speaks of himself and the prophets speak of him in the plural number such phrases are simply a manner of speaking 
and do not mean that there actually are several gods they are to be explained metaphorically not because a plurality of gods is repugnant to reason but because scripture distinctly asserts that there is only one so again as scripture asserts as alpahar thinks in deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 15 that god is incorporeal we are bound solely by the authority of this text and not by reason to believe that god has no body consequently we must explain metaphorically on the sole authority of scripture all those passages which attribute to god hands feet etc and take them merely as figures of speech such is the opinion of alpahar in so far as he seeks to explain scripture by scripture i praise him but i marvel that a man gifted with reason should wish to debase that faculty it is true that scripture should be explained by scripture so long as we are in difficulties about the meaning and intention of the prophets but when we have elicited the true meaning we must of necessity make use of our judgment and reason in order to assent thereto if reason however much as she rebels is to be entirely subjected to scripture i ask are we to effect her submission by her own aid or without her and blindly if the latter we shall surely act foolishly and injudiciously if the former we assent to scripture under the dominion of reason and should not assent to it without her moreover i may ask now is a man to assent to anything against his reason what is denial if it not be reason's refusal to assent in short i am astonished that any one should wish to subject reason the greatest of gifts and a light from on high to the dead letter which may have been corrupted by human malice that it should be taught no crime to speak with contempt of mind the true handwriting of god's word calling it corrupt blind and lost while it is considered the greatest of crimes to say the same of the letter which is merely the reflection and image of god's word men think it is pious to trust nothing to reason and their own judgment and impious to doubt the faith of those who have transmitted to us the sacred books such conduct is not piety but mere folly and after all why are they so anxious what are they afraid of do they think that faith and religion cannot be upheld unless men purposely keep themselves in ignorance and turn their backs on reason if this be so they have but a timid trust in scripture however be it far from me to say that religion should seek to enslave reason or reasoned religion or that both should not be able to keep their sovereignty in perfect harmony i will revert to this question presently for i wish now to discuss alpahar's rule he requires as we have stated that we should accept as true or reject as false everything asserted or denied by scripture and he further states that scripture never expressly asserts or denies anything which contradicts its assertions or negations elsewhere the rashness of such a requirement and statement can escape no one for passing over the fact that he does not notice that scripture consists of different books written at different times for different people by different authors and also that his requirement is made on his own authority without any corroboration from reason or scripture he should be bound to show that all passages which are indirectly contradictory of the rest can be satisfactorily explained metaphorically through the nature of the language and the context further that scripture has come down to us untempered with however we will go into the matter at length firstly i ask what shall we do if reason prove recalcitrant shall we still be bound to affirm whatever scripture affirms and to deny whatever scripture denies perhaps it will be answered that scripture contains nothing repugnant to reason but i insist that it expressly affirms and teaches that god is jealous namely in the decalogue itself and in exodus chapter 34 verse 14 and in deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 24 and in many other places and i assert that such a doctrine is repugnant to reason it must i suppose in spite of all be accepted as true if there are any passages in scripture which imply that god is not jealous they must be taken metaphorically as meaning nothing of the kind so also scripture expressly states exodus chapter 19 verse 20 etc that god came down to mount sinai and it attributes to him other movements from place to place nowhere directly stating that god does not so move wherefore we must take the passage literally and solomon's words first kings chapter 8 verse 27 but will god dwell on the earth behold the heavens and earth cannot contain thee inasmuch as they do not expressly state that god does not move from place to place but only imply it must be explained away till they have no further semblance of denying locomotion to the deity so also we must believe that the sky is the habitation and throne of god for scripture expressly says so 
and similarly many passages expressing the opinions of the prophets or the multitude which reason and philosophy but not scripture tell us to be false must be taken as true if we are to follow the guidance of our author for according to him reason has nothing to do with the matter further it is untrue that scripture never contradicts itself directly but only by implication for moses says in so many words deuteronomy chapter four verse twenty four the lord thy god is a consuming fire and elsewhere expressly denies that god has any likeness to visible things deuteronomy chapter four verse twelve if it be decided that the latter passage only contradicts the former by implication and must be adapted thereto lest it seem to negative it let us grant that god is a fire or rather lest we should seem to have taken leave of our senses let us pass the matter over and take another example samuel expressly denies that god ever repents for he is not a man that he should repent first samuel chapter 15 verse 29 jeremiah on the other hand asserts that god does repent both of the evil and of the good which he had intended to do jeremiah chapter 18 verses 8 to 10 what are not these two texts directly contradictory which of the two then would our author want to explain metaphorically both statements are general and each is the opposite of the other what one flatly affirms the other flatly denies so by his own rule he would be obliged at once to reject them as false and to accept them as true again what is the point of one passage not being contradicted by another directly but only by implication if the implication is clear and the nature and context of the passage preclude metaphorical interpretation there are many such instances in the bible as we saw in chapter two where we pointed out that the prophet held different and contradictory opinions and also in chapters nine and ten where we drew attention to the contradictions in the historical narratives there is no need for me to go through them all again for what i have said sufficiently exposes the absurdities which would follow from an opinion and rule such as we are discussing and shows the hastiness of its propounder we may therefore put this theory as well as that of maimonides entirely out of court and we may take it for indisputable that theology is not bound to serve reason nor reason theology but that each has her own domain the sphere of reason is as we have said truth and wisdom the sphere of theology is piety and obedience the power of reason does not extend so far as to determine for us that men may be blessed through simple obedience without understanding theology tells us nothing else enjoins on us no command save obedience and has neither the will nor the power to oppose reason she defines the dogmas of faith as we pointed out in the last chapter only in so far as they may be necessary for obedience and leaves reason to determine their precise truth for reason is the light of the mind and without her all things are dreams and phantoms by theology i here mean strictly speaking revelation in so far as it indicates the object aimed at by scripture namely the scheme and manner of obedience or the true dogmas of piety and faith this may truly be called the word of god which does not consist in a certain number of books see chapter twelve theology thus understood if we regard its precepts or rules of life will be found in accordance with reason and if we look to its aim and object it will be seen to be in no wise repugnant thereto wherefore it is universal to all men as for its bearing on scripture we have shown in chapter seven that the meaning of scripture should be gathered from its own history and not from the history of nature in general which is the basis of philosophy we ought not to be hindered if we find that our investigation of the meaning of scripture thus conducted shows us that it is here and there repugnant to reason for whatever we may find of this sort in the bible which men may be in ignorance of without injury to their charity has we may be sure no bearing on theology or the word of god and may therefore without blame be viewed by every one as he pleases to sum up we may draw the absolute conclusion that the bible must not be accommodated to reason nor reason to the bible now inasmuch as the basis of theology the doctrine that man may be saved by obedience alone cannot be proved by reason whether it be true or false we may be asked why then should we believe it if we do so without the aid of reason we accept it blindly and act foolishly and injudiciously if on the other hand we settle that it can be proved by reason theology becomes a part of philosophy and inseparable therefrom 
but i make answer that i have absolutely established that this basis of theology cannot be investigated by the natural light of reason or at any rate that no one ever has proved it by such means and therefore revelation was necessary we should however make use of our reason in order to grasp with moral certainty what is revealed i say with moral certainty for we cannot hope to attain greater certainty than the prophets yet their certainty was only moral as i showed in chapter two those therefore who attempt to set forth the authority of scripture with mathematical demonstrations are wholly in error for the authority of the bible is dependent on the authority of the prophets and can be supported by no stronger arguments than those employed in old time by the prophets for convincing the people of their own authority our certainty on the same subject can be founded on no other basis than that which served as foundation for the certainty of the prophets now the certainty of the prophets consisted as we pointed out in these three elements one a distinct and vivid imagination two a sign three lastly and chiefly a mind turned to what is just and good it was based on no other reason than these and consequently they cannot prove their authority by any other reasons either to the multitude whom they addressed orally nor to us whom they address in writing the first of these reasons namely the vivid imagination could be valid only for the prophets therefore our certainty concerning revelation must and ought to be based on the remaining two namely the sign and the teaching such is the express doctrine of moses for in deuteronomy chapter eighteen he bids the people obey the prophet who should give a true sign in the name of the lord but if he should predict falsely even though it were in the name of the lord he should be put to death as should also he who strives to lead away the people from the true religion though he confirm his authority with signs and potents we may compare with the above deuteronomy chapter thirteen whence it follows that a true prophet could be distinguished from a false one both by his doctrine and by the miracles he wrought for moses declares such an one to be a true prophet and bids the people trust him without fear of deceit he condemns as false and worthy of death those who predict anything falsely even in the name of the lord or who preach false gods even though their miracles be real the only reason then which we have for belief in scripture or the writings of the prophets is a doctrine we find therein and the signs by which it is confirmed for as we see that the prophets extol charity and justice above all things and have no other object we conclude that they did not write from unworthy motives but because they really thought that men might become blessed through obedience and faith further as we see that they confirm their teaching with signs and wonders we become persuaded that they did not speak at random nor run riot in their prophecies we are further strengthened in our conclusion by the fact that the morality they teach is in evident agreement with reason for it is no accidental coincidence that the word of god which we find in the prophets coincides with the word of god written in our hearts we may i say conclude this from the sacred books as certainly as did the jews of old from the living voice of the prophets for we showed in chapter twelve that scripture has come down to us intact in respect to its doctrine and main narratives therefore this whole basis of theology and scripture though it does not admit of mathematical proof may yet be accepted with the approval of our judgment it would be folly to refuse to accept what is confirmed by such ample prophetic testimony and what has proved such a comfort to those whose reason is comparatively weak and such a benefit to the state a doctrine moreover which we may believe in without the slightest peril or hurt and should reject simply because it cannot be mathematically proved it is as though we should admit nothing is true or as a wise rule of life which could ever in any possible way be called in question or as though most of our actions were not full of uncertainty and hazard i admit that those who believe that theology and philosophy are mutually contradictory and that therefore either one or the other must be thrust from its throne i admit i say that such persons are not unreasonable in attempting to put theology on a firm basis and to demonstrate its truth mathematically who unless he were desperate or mad would wish to bid an incontinent farewell to reason or to despise the arts and sciences or to deny reason's certitude but in the meanwhile we cannot wholly absolve them from blame inasmuch as they invoke the aid of reason for her own defeat and attempt infallibility to prove her fallible while they are trying to prove mathematically the authority and truth of theology and to take away the authority of natural reason 
they are in reality only bringing theology under reason's dominion and proving that her authority has no weight unless natural reason be at the back of it if they boast that they themselves assent because of the inward testimony of the holy spirit and that they only invoke the aid of reason because of unbelievers in order to convince them not even so can this meet with our approval for we can easily show that they have spoken either from emotion or vainglory it most clearly follows from the last chapter that the holy spirit only gives its testimony in favor of works called by paul in galatians chapter 5 verse 22 the fruits of the spirit and is in itself really nothing but the mental acquiescence which follows a good action in our souls no spirit gives testimony concerning the certitude of matters within the sphere of speculation save only reason who is mistress as we have shown of the whole realm of truth if then they assert that they possess this spirit which makes them certain of truth they speak falsely and according to the prejudices of the emotions or else they are in great dread lest they should be vanquished by philosophers and exposed to public ridicule and therefore they flee as it were to the altar but their refuge is vain for what altar will shelter a man who has outraged reason however i pass such persons over for i think i have fulfilled my purpose and shown how philosophy should be separated from theology and wherein each consists that neither should be subservient to the other but that each should keep her unopposed dominion lastly as occasion offered i have pointed out the absurdities the inconveniences and the evils following from the extraordinary confusion which has hitherto prevailed between the two subjects owing to their not being properly distinguished and separated before i go further I would expressly state, though I have said it before, that I consider the utility and the need for Holy Scripture or Revelation to be very great. For as we cannot perceive by the natural light of reason that simple obedience is the path of salvation, and are taught by revelation only that it is so by the special grace of God, which our reason cannot attain, it follows that the Bible has brought a very great consolation to mankind all are able to obey whereas they are but very few compared with the aggregate of humanity who can acquire the habit of virtue under the unaided guidance of reason thus if we had not the testimony of scripture we should doubt of the salvation of nearly all men end of section 16 read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama Section 17 of A Theological-Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza, translated by Robert Harvey Munro Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 16. Of the Foundations of a State, of the Natural and Civil Rights of Individuals, and of the Rights of the Sovereign Power. Hitherto our care has been to separate philosophy from theology, and to show the freedom of thought which such separation ensures to both. It is now time to determine the limits to which such freedom of thought and discussion may extend itself in the ideal state. For the due consideration of this question, we must examine the foundations of a state, first turning our attention to the natural rights of individuals, and afterwards to religion and the state as a whole. By the right and ordinance of nature, I merely mean those natural laws wherewith we conceive every individual to be conditioned by nature, so as to live and act in a given way. For instance, fishes are naturally conditioned for swimming, and the greater for devouring the less. Therefore fishes enjoy the water, and the greater devour the less by sovereign natural right. For it is certain that nature, taken in the abstract, has sovereign right to do anything she can. In other words, her right is coextensive with her power. The power of nature is the power of God, which has sovereign right over all things, and inasmuch as the power of nature is simply the aggregate of the powers of all her individual components, it follows that every individual has sovereign right to do all that he can. In other words, the rights of an individual extend to the utmost limits of his power as it has been conditioned. Now it is a sovereign law and right of nature that each individual should endeavor to preserve itself as it is without regard to anything but itself. Therefore this sovereign law and right belongs to every individual namely to exist and act according to its natural conditions we do not here acknowledge any difference between mankind and other individual natural entities nor between men endowed with reason and those to whom reason is unknown nor between fools madmen and sane men whatsoever an individual does by the laws of its nature 
it has a sovereign right to do, inasmuch as it acts as it was conditioned by nature, and cannot act otherwise. Wherefore among men, so long as they are considered as living under the sway of nature, he who does not yet know reason, or who has not yet acquired the habit of virtue, acts solely according to the laws of his desire, with as sovereign a right as he who orders his life entirely by the laws of reason. That is, as the wise man has sovereign right to do all that reason dictates, or to live according to the laws of reason, so also the ignorant and foolish man has sovereign right to do all that desire dictates, or to live according to the laws of desire. This is identical with the teaching of Paul, who acknowledges that previous to the law, that is, so long as men are considered off as living under the sway of nature, there is no sin. The natural right of the individual man is thus determined not by sound reason, but by desire and power. All are not naturally conditioned so as to act according to the laws and rules of reason. Nay, on the contrary, all men are born ignorant, and before they can learn the right way of life and acquire the habit of virtue, the greater part of their life, even if they have been well brought up, has passed away. Nevertheless, they are in the meanwhile bound to live and preserve themselves as far as they can by the unaided impulses of desire. Nature has given to them no other guide and has denied them the present power of living according to sound reason, so that they are no more bound to live by the dictates of an enlightened mind than a cat is bound to live by the laws of the nature of a lion. Whatsoever, therefore, an individual, considered as under the sway of nature, thinks useful for himself, whether led by sound reason or impelled by the passions that he has sovereign right to seek and to take for himself as he best can, whether by force, cunning, entreaty, or any other means. Consequently, he may regard as an enemy any one who hinders the accomplishment of his purpose. It follows from what we have said that the right and the ordinance of nature, under which all men are born, and under which they mostly live, only prohibits such things as no one desires and no one can attain. It does not forbid strife, nor hatred, nor anger, nor deceit, nor indeed any of the means suggested by desire. This we need not wonder at, for nature is not bounded by the laws of human reason, which aims only at man's true benefit and preservation. Her limits are infinitely wider, and have reference to the eternal order of nature, wherein man is but a speck. It is by the necessity of this alone that all individuals are conditioned for living and acting in a particular way. If anything, therefore, in nature seems to us ridiculous, absurd, or evil, it is because we only know in part and are almost entirely ignorant of the order and interdependence of nature as a whole, and also because we want everything to be arranged according to the dictates of our human reason. In reality, that which reason considers evil is not evil in respect to the order and laws of nature as a whole, but only in respect to the laws of our reason. Nevertheless, no one can doubt that it is much better for us to live according to the laws and assure dictates of reason, for, as we have said, they have men's true good for their object. Moreover, every one wishes to live as far as possible securely beyond the reach of fear, and this would be quite impossible so long as every one did everything he liked, and reason's claim was lowered to a par with those of hatred and anger. There is no one who is not ill at ease in the midst of enmity, hatred, anger, and deceit, and who does not seek to avoid them as much as he can. When we reflect that men without mutual help or the aid of reason must needs live most miserably, as we clearly proved in chapter 5, we shall plainly see that men must necessarily come to an agreement to live together as securely and well as possible if they are to enjoy as a whole the rights which naturally belong to them as individuals, and their life should be no more conditioned by the force and desire of individuals, but by the power and will of the whole body. This end they will be unable to attain if desire be their only guide. For by the laws of desire, each man is drawn in a different direction. They must, therefore, most firmly decree and establish that they will be guided in everything by reason, which nobody will dare openly to repudiate lest he should be taken for a madman, and will restrain any desire which is injurious to a man's fellows, that they will do to all as they would be done by, and that they will defend their neighbour's rights as their own. How such a compact as this should be entered into, how ratified and established, we will now inquire. Now it is a universal law of human nature that no one ever neglects anything which he judges to be good except with the hope of gaining a greater good 
or from the fear of a greater evil nor does any one endure an evil except for the sake of avoiding a greater evil or gaining a greater good that is every one will of two goods choose that which he thinks the greatest and of two evils that which he thinks the least i say advisedly that which he thinks the greatest or the least for it does not necessarily follow that he judges right this law is so deeply implanted in the human mind that it ought to be counted among eternal truths and axioms as a necessary consequence of the principle just enunciated no one can honestly promise to forego the right which he has over all things and in general no one will abide by his promises unless under the fear of a greater evil or the hope of a greater good an example will make the matter clearer suppose that a robber forces me to promise that i will give him my goods at his will and pleasure it is plain inasmuch as my natural right is as i have shown coextensive with my power that if i can free myself from this robber by stratagem by assenting to his demands i have the natural right to do so and to pretend to accept his conditions or again suppose i have genuinely promised someone that for the space of twenty days i will not taste food or any nourishment and suppose i afterwards find that my promise was foolish and cannot be kept without great injury to myself as i am bound by natural law and right to choose the least of two evils i have complete right to break my compact and act as if my promise had never been uttered i say that i should have perfect natural right to do so whether i was actuated by true and evident reason or whether i was actuated by mere opinion in thinking i had promised rashly whether my reasons were true or false i should be in fear of a greater evil which by the ordinance of nature i should strive to avoid by every means in my power we may therefore conclude that a compact is only made valid by its utility without which it becomes null and void it is therefore foolish to ask a man to keep his faith with us for ever unless we also endeavour that the violation of the compact we enter into shall involve for the violator more harm than good this consideration should have very great weight in forming a state however if all men could be easily led by reason alone and could recognise what is best and most useful for a state there would be no one who would not forswear deceit for every one would keep most religiously to their compact in their desire for the chief good namely the preservation of the state and would cherish good faith above all things as a shield and buckler of the commonwealth however it is far from being the case that all men can always be easily led by reason alone every one is drawn away by his pleasure while avarice ambition envy hatred and the like so engross the mind that reason has no place therein hence though men make promises with all the appearances of good faith and agree that they will keep to their engagement no one can absolutely rely on another man's promise unless there is something behind it every one has by nature a right to act deceitfully and to break his compacts unless he be restrained by the hope of some greater good or the fear of some greater evil however as we have shown that the natural right of the individual is only limited by his power it is clear that by transferring either willingly or under compulsion this power into the hands of another he in so doing necessarily cedes also a part of his right and further that the sovereign right over all men belongs to him who has sovereign power wherewith he can compel men by force or restrain them by threats of the universally feared punishment of death such sovereign right he will retain only so long as he can maintain his power of enforcing his will otherwise he will totter on his throne and no one who is stronger than he will be bound unwillingly to obey him in this manner a society can be formed without any violation of natural right and the covenant can always be strictly kept that is if each individual hands over the whole of his power to the body politic the latter will then possess a sovereign natural right over all things that is it will have sole and unquestioned dominion and every one will be bound to obey under pain of the severest punishment a body politic of this kind is called a democracy which may be defined as a society which wields all its power as a whole the sovereign power is not restrained by any laws but every one is bound to obey it in all things such is the state of things implied when men either tacitly or expressly handed over to it all their power of self-defence or in other words all their right for if they had wished to retain any right for themselves they ought to have taken precautions for its defence and preservation as they have not done so and indeed could not have done so without dividing and consequently ruining the state they place themselves absolutely at the mercy of the sovereign power 
and therefore having acted as we have shown as reason and necessity demanded they are obliged to fulfil the commands of the sovereign power however absurd these may be else they will be public enemies and will act against reason which urges the preservation of the state as a primary duty for reason bids us choose the least of two evils furthermore this danger of submitting absolutely to the dominion and will of another is one which may be incurred with a light heart for we have shown that sovereigns only possess this right of imposing their will so long as they have the full power to enforce it if such power be lost their right to command is lost also or lapse to those who have assumed it and can keep it thus it is very rare for sovereigns to impose thoroughly irrational commands for they are bound to consult their own interests and retain their power by consulting the public good and acting according to the dictates of reason as seneca says violenta imperia nemo continuit diu no one can long retain a tyrant's sway in a democracy irrational commands are still less to be feared for it is almost impossible that the majority of a people especially if it be a large one should agree in an irrational design and moreover the basis and aim of a democracy is to avoid the desires as irrational and to bring men as far as possible under the control of reason so that they may live in peace and harmony if this basis be removed the whole fabric falls to ruin such being the ends in view for the sovereign power the duty of subjects is as i have said to obey its commands and to recognize no right save that which it sanctions it will perhaps be thought that we are turning subjects into slaves for slaves obey commands and free men live as they like but this idea is based on a misconception for the true slave is he who is led away by his pleasures and can neither see what is good for him nor act accordingly he alone is free who lives with free consent under the entire guidance of reason action in obedience to orders does take away freedom in a certain sense but it does not therefore make a man a slave all depends on the object of the action if the object of the action be the good of the state and not the good of the agent the latter is a slave and does himself no good but in a state or kingdom where the will of the whole people and not that of the ruler is the supreme law obedience to the sovereign power does not make a man a slave of no use to himself but a subject therefore that state is the freest whose laws are founded on sound reason so that every member of it may if he will be free that is live with full consent under the entire guidance of reason children though they are bound to obey all the commands of their parents are yet not slaves for the commands of parents look generally to the children's benefit we must therefore acknowledge a great difference between a slave a son and a subject their positions may be thus defined a slave is one who is bound to obey his master's orders though they are given solely in the master's interest a son is one who obeys his father's orders given in his own interest a subject obeys the orders of the sovereign power given for the common interest wherein he is included i think i have now shown sufficiently clearly the basis of a democracy i have especially desired to do so for i believe it to be of all forms of government the most natural and the most consonant with individual liberty in it no one transfers his natural rights so absolutely that he has no further voice in affairs he only hands it over to the majority of a society whereof he is a unit thus all men remain as they were in the state of nature equals this is the only form of government which i have treated of at length for it is the one most akin to my purpose of showing the benefits of freedom in a state i may pass over the fundamental principles of other forms of government for we may gather from what has been said whence their right arises without going into its origin the possessor of sovereign power whether he be one or many or the whole body politic has the sovereign right of imposing any commands he pleases and he who has either voluntarily or under compulsion transferred the right to defend him to another has in doing so renounced his natural right and is therefore bound to obey in all things the commands of the sovereign power and will be bound to do so as long as the king or nobles or the people preserve the sovereign power which formed the basis of the original transfer i need add no more the bases and rights of dominion being thus displayed we shall readily be able to define private civil rights wrong justice and injustice with their relations to the state and also to determine what constitutes an ally or an enemy or the crime of treason by private civil rights we can only mean the liberty every man possesses to preserve his existence 
a liberty limited by the edicts of the sovereign power, and preserved only by its authority. For when a man has transferred to another his right of living as he likes, which was only limited by his power, that is, has transferred his liberty and power of self-defence, he is bound to live as the other dictates, and to trust to him entirely for his defence. Wrong takes place when a citizen or subject is forced by another to undergo some loss or pain in contradiction to the authority of the law or the edict of the sovereign power. Wrong is conceivable only in an organised community, nor can it ever accrue to subjects from any act of the sovereign who has a right to do what he likes. It can only arise, therefore, between private persons who are bound by law and right not to injure one another. Justice consists in the habitual rendering to every man his lawful due. Injustice consists in depriving a man under the pretense of legality or what the laws, rightly interpreted, would allow him. These last are also called equity and iniquity, because those who administer the laws are bound to show no respect of persons but to account all men equal, and to defend every man's right equally, neither envying the rich nor despising the poor. The men of two states become allies, when for the sake of avoiding war, or for some other advantage, they covenant to do each other no hurt, but on the contrary to assist each other if necessity arises, each retaining his independence. Such a covenant is valid so long as its basis of danger or advantage is in force. No one enters into an engagement or is bound to stand by his compacts unless there be a hope of some accruing good or the fear of some evil. If this basis be removed, the compact thereby becomes void. This has been abundantly shown by experience. For although different states make treaties not to harm one another, they always take every possible precaution against such treaties being broken by the stronger party, and do not rely on the compact unless there is a sufficiently obvious object and advantage to both parties in observing it. Otherwise, they would fear a breach of faith, nor would there be any wrong done thereby. For who, in his proper senses, and aware of the right of the sovereign power, would trust in the promises of one who has the will and the power to do what he likes, and who aims solely at the safety and advantage of his dominion? Moreover, if we consult loyalty and religion, we shall see that no one in possession of power ought to abide by his promises to the injury of his dominion. For he cannot keep such promises without breaking the engagement he made with his subjects, by which both he and they are most solemnly bound. An enemy is one who lives apart from the state, and does not recognize its authority either as a subject or as an ally. It is not hatred which makes a man an enemy, but the rights of the state. The rights of the state are the same in regard to him who does not recognize by any compact the state authority, as they are against him who has done the state an injury. It has a right to force him as best it can, either to submit or to contract an alliance. Lastly, treason can only be committed by subjects who by compact, either tacit or expressed, have transferred all their rights to the state. A subject is said to have committed this crime when he has attempted, for whatever reason, to seize the sovereign power or to place it in different hands. I say has attempted, for if punishment were not to overtake him till he has succeeded, it would often come too late the sovereign rights would have been acquired or transferred already. I also say has attempted, for whatever reason, to seize the sovereign power, and I recognize no difference whether such an attempt should be followed by public loss or public gain. Whatever be his reason for acting, the crime is treason, and he is rightly condemned. In war, everyone would admit the justice of the sentence. If a man does not keep to his post, but approaches the enemy without the knowledge of his commander, Whatever may be his motive, so long as he acts on his own motion, even if he advances with the design of defeating the enemy, he is rightly put to death, because he has violated his oath and infringed the rights of his commander. That all citizens are equally bound by these rights in time of peace is not so generally recognized, but the reasons for obedience are in both cases identical. The state must be preserved and directed by the sole authority of the sovereign, and such authority and right have been accorded by universal consent to him alone. If, therefore, any one else attempts without his consent to execute any public enterprise, even though the state might, as we said, reap a benefit therefrom, such person has nonetheless infringed the sovereign's right and would be rightly punished for treason. In order that every scruple may be removed, we may now answer the inquiry 
whether our former assertion that every one who has not the practice of reason may in the state of nature live by sovereign natural right according to the laws of his desires is not in direct opposition to the law and right of god is revealed for as all men absolutely whether they be less endowed with reason or more are equally bound by the divine command to love their neighbor as themselves it may be said that they cannot without wrong do injury to any one or live according to their desires this objection so far as the state of nature is concerned can be easily answered for the state of nature is both in nature and in time prior to religion no one knows by nature that he owes any obedience to god nor can he attain thereto by any exercise of his reason but solely by revelation confirmed by science therefore previous to revelation no one is bound by a divine law and right of which he is necessarily in ignorance the state of nature must by no means be confounded with the state of religion but must be conceived as without either religion or law and consequently without sin or wrong this is how we have described it and we are confirmed by the authority of paul it is not only in respect of ignorance that we conceive the state of nature as prior to and lacking the divine revealed law and right but in respect of freedom also wherewith all men are born endowed if men were naturally bound by the divine law and right or if the divine law and right were a natural necessity there would have been no need for god to make a covenant with mankind and to bind them thereunto with an oath and agreement we must then fully grant that the divine law and right originated at the time when men by express covenant agreed to obey god in all things and ceded as it were their natural freedom transferring their rights to god in the manner described in speaking of the formation of a state however i will treat of these matters more at length presently it may be insisted that sovereigns are as much bound by the divine law as subjects whereas we have asserted that they retain their natural rights and may do whatever they like in order to clear up the whole difficulty which arises rather concerning the natural right than the natural state i maintain that every one is bound in the state of nature to live according to divine law in the same way as he is bound to live according to the dictates of sound reason namely inasmuch as it is to his advantage and necessary for his salvation but if he will not so live he may do otherwise at his own risk he is thus bound to live according to his own laws not according to any one else's and to recognize no man as a judge or as a superior in religion such in my opinion is the position of a sovereign for he may take advice from his fellow men but he is not bound to recognize any as a judge nor any one besides himself as an arbitrator on any question of right unless it be a prophet sent expressly by god and attesting his mission by indisputable signs even then he does not recognize a man but god himself as his judge if a sovereign refuses to obey god as revealed in his law he does so at his own risk and loss but without violating any civil or natural right for the civil right is dependent on his own decree and natural right is dependent on the laws of nature which latter are not adapted to religion whose sole aim is the good of humanity but to the order of nature that is to god's eternal decree unknown to us this truth seems to be adumbrated in a somewhat obscure form by those who maintain that men can sin against god's revelation but not against the eternal decree by which he has ordained all things we may be asked what should we do if the sovereign commands anything contrary to religion and the obedience which we have expressly vowed to god should we obey the divine law or the human law i shall treat of this question at length hereafter and will therefore merely say now that god should be obeyed before all else when we have a certain and indisputable revelation of his will but men are very prone to error on religious subjects and according to the diversity of their dispositions are wont with considerable stir to put forward their own inventions as experience more than sufficiently attests so that if no one were bound to obey the state in matters which in his own opinion concern religion the rights of the state would be dependent on every man's judgment and passions no one would consider himself bound to obey laws framed against his faith or superstition and on this pretext he might assume unbounded license in this way the rights of the civil authorities would be utterly set at naught so that we must conclude that the sovereign power which alone is bound both by divine and natural right to preserve and guard the laws of the state should have supreme authority for making any laws about religion which it thinks fit all are bound to obey its behests on the subject in accordance with their promise which god bids them to keep
however if the sovereign power be heathen we should either enter into no engagements therewith and yield up our lives sooner than transfer to it any of our rights or if the engagement be made and our rights transferred we should inasmuch as we should have ourselves transferred the right of defending ourselves in our religion be bound to obey them and to keep our word we might even rightly be bound to do so except in those cases where god by indisputable revelation has promised his special aid against tyranny or given us special exemption from obedience thus we see that of all the jews in babylon there were only three youths who were certain of the help of god and therefore refused to obey nebuchadnezzar all the rest with the sole exception of daniel who was beloved by the king were doubtless compelled by right to obey perhaps thinking that they had been delivered up by god into the hands of the king and that the king had obtained and preserved his dominion by god's design on the other hand eleazar before his country had utterly fallen wished to give a proof of his constancy to his compatriots in order that they might follow in his footsteps and go to any lengths rather than allow their right and power to be transferred to the greeks or brave any torture rather than swear allegiance to the heathen instances are occurring every day in confirmation of what i here advance the rulers of christian kingdoms do not hesitate with a view to strengthening their dominion to make treaties with turks and heathen and to give orders to their subjects who settle among such people not to assume more freedom either in things secular or religious than is set down in the treaty or allowed by the foreign government we may see this exemplified in the dutch treaty with the japanese which i have already mentioned End of section 17, read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 18 of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza. Translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 17 it is shown that no one can or need transfer all his rights to the sovereign power of the hebrew republic as it was during the lifetime of moses and after his death till the foundation of the monarchy and of its excellence lastly of the causes why the theocratic republic fell and why it could hardly have continued without dissension the theory put forward in the last chapter of the universal rights of the sovereign power and of the natural rights of the individual transferred thereto though it corresponds in many respects with actual practice and though practice may be so arranged as to conform to it more and more must nevertheless always remain in many respects purely ideal no one can ever so utterly transfer to another his power and consequently his rights as to cease to be a man nor can there ever be a power so sovereign that it can carry out every possible wish it will always be vain to order a subject to hate what he believes brings him advantage or to love what brings him loss or not to be offended at insults or not to wish to be free from fear or a hundred other things of the sort which necessarily follow from the laws of human nature so much i think is abundantly shown by experience for men have never so far ceded their power as to cease to be an object of fear to the rulers who receive such power and right and dominions have always been in as much danger from their own subjects as from external enemies if it were really the case that men could be deprived of their natural rights so utterly as never to have any further influence on affairs except with the permission of the holders of sovereign right it would then be possible to maintain with impunity the most violent tyranny which i suppose no one would for an instant admit we must therefore grant that every man retains some part of his right in dependence of his own decision and no one else's however in order correctly to understand the extent of the sovereign's right and power we must take notice that it does not cover only those actions to which it can compel men by fear but absolutely every action which it can induce men to perform for it is the fact of obedience not the motive for obedience which makes a man a subject whatever be the cause which leads a man to obey the commands of the sovereign whether it be fear or hope or love of his country or any other emotion the fact remains that the man takes counsel with himself and nevertheless acts as his sovereign orders we must not therefore assert that all actions resulting from a man's deliberation with himself are done in obedience to the rights of the individual rather than the sovereign 
as a matter of fact all actions spring from a man's deliberation with himself whether the determining motive be love or fear of punishment therefore either dominion does not exist and has no rights over its subjects or else it extends over every instance in which it can prevail on men to decide to obey it consequently every action which a subject performs in accordance with the commands of the sovereign whether such actions spring from love or fear or as is more frequently the case or from hope and fear together or from reverence compounded of fear and admiration or indeed any motive whatever is performed in virtue of his submission to the sovereign and not in virtue of his own authority this point is made still more clearly by the fact that obedience does not consist so much in the outward act as in the mental state of the person obeying so that he is most under the dominion of another who with his whole heart determines to obey another's commands and consequently the firmest dominion belongs to the sovereign who has most influence over the minds of his subjects if those who are most feared possess the firmest dominion the firmest dominion would belong to the subjects of a tyrant for they are always greatly feared by their ruler furthermore though it is impossible to govern the mind as completely as the tongue nevertheless minds are to a certain extent under the control of the sovereign for he can in many ways bring about that the greatest part of his subjects should follow his wishes in their beliefs their loves and their hates though such emotions do not arise at the express command of the sovereign they often result as experience shows from the authority of his power and from his direction in other words in virtue of his right we may therefore without doing violence to our understanding conceive men who follow the instigation of their sovereign in their beliefs their loves their hates their contempt and all other emotions whatsoever though the powers of government as thus conceived are sufficiently ample they can never become large enough to execute every possible wish of their possessors this i think i have already shown clearly enough the method of forming a dominion which should prove lasting i do not as i have said intend to discuss but in order to arrive at the object i have in view i will touch on the teaching of divine revelation to moses in this respect and we will consider the history and the success of the jews gathering therefrom what should be the chief concessions made by sovereigns to their subjects with a view to the security and increase of their dominion that the preservation of a state chiefly depends on the subjects fidelity and constancy in carrying out the orders they receive is most clearly taught both by reason and experience how subjects ought to be guided so as best to preserve their fidelity and virtue is not so obvious all both rulers and ruled are men and prone to follow after their lusts the fickle disposition of the multitude almost reduces those who have experience of it to despair for it is governed solely by emotions not by reason it rushes headlong into every enterprise and is easily corrupted either by avarice or luxury every one thinks himself omniscient and wishes to fashion all things to his liking judging a thing to be just or unjust lawful or unlawful according as he thinks it will bring him profit or loss vanity leads him to despise his equals and refuse their guidance envy of superior fame or fortune for such gifts are never equally distributed leads him to desire and rejoice in his neighbor's downfall i need not go through the whole list every one knows already how much crime results from disgust at the present desire for change headlong anger and contempt for poverty and how men's minds are engrossed and kept in turmoil thereby to guard against all these evils and form a dominion where no room is left for deceit to frame our institutions so that every man whatever his disposition may prefer public right to private advantage this is the task and this the toil necessity is often the mother of invention but she has never yet succeeded in framing a dominion that was in less danger from its own citizens than from open enemies or whose rulers did not fear the latter less than the former witness the state of rome invincible by her enemies but many times conquered and sorely oppressed by her own citizens especially in the war between vespasian and vitellius see tacitus histories book four for a description of the pitiable state of the city alexander thought prestige abroad more easy to acquire than prestige at home and believed that his greatness could be destroyed by his own followers fearing such a disaster he thus addressed his friends keep me safe from internal treachery and domestic plots and i will front without fear the dangers of battle and of war philip was more secure in the battle array than in the theatre he often escaped from the hands of the enemy he could not escape from his own subjects if you think over the deaths of kings you will count up more who have died by the assassin than by the open foe 
Q. Curtius, chapter 6. For the sake of making themselves secure, kings who seized the throne in ancient times used to try to spread the idea that they were descended from the immortal gods, thinking that if their subjects and the rest of mankind did not look on them as equals, but believed them to be gods, they would willingly submit to their rule and obey their commands. Thus Augustus persuaded the Romans that he was descended from Aeneas, who was a son of Venus, and numbered among the gods. He wished himself to be worshipped in temples like the gods, with flamens and priests. Tacitus, Annals, Chapter 1, Verse 10 Alexander wished to be saluted as a son of Jupiter, not from motives of pride, but of policy, as he showed by his answer to the invective of Hermolaus. It is almost laughable, said he, that Hermolaus asked me to contradict Jupiter, by whose oracle I am recognized. Am I responsible for the answers of the gods? It offered me the name of son, acquiescence was by no means foreign to my present designs. Would that the Indians also would believe me to be a god. Wars are carried through by prestige, falsehoods that are believed often gain the force of truth. Curtius, chapter 8, verse 8. In these few words he cleverly contrives to palm off a fiction on the ignorant, and at the same time hints at the motive for the deception. Cleon, in his speech persuading the Macedonians to obey their king, adopted a similar device. For after going through the praises of Alexander with admiration, and recalling his merits, he proceeds. The Persians are not only pious, but prudent in worshipping their kings as gods, for kingship is a shield of public safety. And he ends thus, I myself, when the king enters a banquet hall, should prostrate my body on the ground. Other men should do the like, especially those who are wise. Curtius, chapter 8, verse 65. However, the Macedonians were more prudent. Indeed, it is only complete barbarians who can be so openly cajoled, and can suffer themselves to be turned from subjects into slaves without interests of their own. Others, notwithstanding, have been able more easily to spread the belief that kingship is sacred, and place the part of God on the earth, that it has been instituted by God, not by the suffrage and consent of men, and that it is preserved and guarded by divine special providence and aid. Similar fictions have been promulgated by monarchs with the object of strengthening their dominion, but these I will pass over, and in order to arrive at my main purpose, will merely recall and discuss the teaching on the subject of divine revelation to Moses in ancient times. We have said in chapter 5 that after the Hebrews came up out of Egypt, they were not bound by the law and right of any other nation, but were at liberty to institute any new rights at their pleasure, and to occupy whatever territory they chose. After their liberation from the intolerable bondage of the Egyptians, they were bound by no covenant to any man and therefore every man entered into his natural right, and was free to retain it or to give it up, and transfer it to another. Being then in the state of nature, they followed the advice of Moses, in whom they chiefly trusted, and decided to transfer their right to no human being, but only to God. Without further delay, they all, with one voice, promised to obey all the commands of the deity, and to acknowledge no right that he did not proclaim as such by prophetic revelation. This promise, or transference of right to God, was effected in the same manner as we have conceived it to have been in ordinary societies, when men agree to divest themselves of their natural rights. It is in fact in virtue of a set covenant as an oath, see Exodus chapter 34 verse 7, that the Jews freely, and not under compulsion or threats, surrendered their rights and transferred them to God. Moreover, in order that this covenant might be ratified and settled, and might be free from all suspicion of deceit, God did not enter into it till the Jews had had experience of his wonderful power, by which alone they had been, or could be, preserved in a state of prosperity. Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 and 5. It is because they believed that nothing but God's power could preserve them, that they surrendered to God the natural power of self-preservation, which they formerly, perhaps, thought they possessed, and consequently they surrendered at the same time all their natural right. God alone therefore held dominion over the Hebrews, whose state was in virtue of the covenant called God's kingdom, and God was said to be their king. Consequently, the enemies of the Jews were said to be the enemies of God, and the citizens who tried to seize the dominion were guilty of treason against God, and lastly, the laws of the state were called the laws and commandments of God. Thus in the Hebrew state, the civil and religious authority, each consisting solely of obedience to God, were one and the same. The dogmas of religion were not precepts, but laws and ordinances. Piety was regarded as the same as loyalty, impiety as the same as disaffection. Every one who fell away from religion ceased to be a citizen, and was on that ground alone accounted an enemy. 
those who died for the sake of religion were held to have died for their country in fact between civil and religious law and right there was no distinction whatever for this reason the government could be called a theocracy inasmuch as the citizens were not bound by anything save the revelations of god however this state of things existed rather in theory than in practice for it will appear from what we are about to say that the hebrews as a matter of fact retained absolutely in their own hands the right of sovereignty this is shown by the method and plan by which the government was carried on as i will now explain inasmuch as the hebrews did not transfer their rights to any other person but as in a democracy all surrendered their rights equally and cried out with one voice whatsoever god shall speak no mediator or mouthpiece being named that we will do it follows that all were equally bound by the covenant and that all had an equal right to consult the deity to accept and to interpret his laws so that all had an exactly equal share of the government thus at first they all approached god together so that they might learn his commands but in this first salutation they were thoroughly terrified and so astounded to hear god speaking that they thought their last hour was at hand full of fear therefore they went afresh to moses and said lo we have heard god speaking in the fire and there is no cause why we should wish to die surely this great fire will consume us if we hear again the voice of god we shall surely die thou therefore go near and hear all the words of our god and thou not god shall speak with us all that god shall tell us that we will hearken to and perform thus they clearly abrogated their former covenant and absolutely transferred to moses their right to consult god and interpret his commands for they do not here promise obedience to all that that god shall tell them but to all that god shall tell moses see deuteronomy chapter 5 after the decalogue and chapter 18 verses 15 and 16 moses therefore remained the sole promulgator and interpreter of the divine laws and consequently also the sovereign judge who could not be arraigned himself and who acted among the hebrews the part of god in other words held the sovereign kingship he alone had the right to consult god to give the divine answers to the people and to see that they were carried out i say he alone for if any one during the life of moses was desirous of preaching anything in the name of the lord he was even if a true prophet considered guilty and a usurper of the sovereign right numbers chapter 11 verse 28 we may here notice that though the people had elected moses they could not rightfully elect moses's successor for having transferred to moses their right of consulting god and absolutely promised to regard him as a divine oracle they had plainly forfeited the whole of their right and were bound to accept as chosen by god any one proclaimed by moses as his successor if moses had so chosen his successor who like him would wield the sole right of government possessing the sole right of consulting god and consequently of making and abrogating laws of deciding on peace or war of sending ambassadors appointing judges in fact discharging all the functions of a sovereign the state would have become simply a monarchy only differing from other monarchies in the fact that the latter are or should be carried on in accordance with god's decree unknown even to the monarch whereas the hebrew monarch would have been the only person to whom the decree was revealed a difference which increases rather than diminishes the monarch's authority as far as the people in both cases are concerned each would be equally subject and equally ignorant of the divine decree for each would be dependent on the monarch's words and would learn from him alone what was lawful or unlawful nor would the fact that the people believed that the monarch was only issuing commands in accordance with god's decree revealed to him make it less in subjection but rather more however moses elected no such successor but left the dominion to those who came after him in a condition which could not be called a popular government nor an aristocracy nor a monarchy but a theocracy for the right of interpreting laws was vested in one man while the right and power of administering the state according to the laws thus interpreted was vested in another man see numbers chapter twenty seven verse twenty one in order that the question may be thoroughly understood i will duly set forth the administration of the whole state first the people were commanded to build a tabernacle which should be as it were the dwelling of god that is of the sovereign authority of the state this tabernacle was to be erected at the cost of the whole people not of one man in order that the place where god was consulted might be public property the levites were chosen as courtiers and administrators of this royal abode while aaron the brother of moses was chosen to be their chief and second as it were to god their king being succeeded in the office by his legitimate sons 
he as the nearest to god was a sovereign interpreter of the divine laws he communicated the answers of the divine oracle to the people and entreated god's favor for them if in addition to these privileges he had possessed the right of ruling he would have been neither more or less than an absolute monarch but in respect to government he was only a private citizen the whole tribe of levi was so completely divested of governing rights that it did not even take its share with the others in the partition of territory moses provided for its support by inspiring the common people with great reverence for it as the only tribe dedicated to god further the army formed from the remaining twelve tribes was commanded to invade the land of canaan to divide it into twelve portions and to distribute it among the tribes by lot for this task twelve captains were chosen one from every tribe and were together with joshua and eleazar the high priest empowered to divide the land into twelve equal parts and distribute it by lot joshua was chosen for the chief command of the army inasmuch as none but he had the right to consult god in emergencies not like moses alone in his tent or in the tabernacle but through the high priest to whom only the answers of god were revealed furthermore he was empowered to execute and cause the people to obey god's commands transmitted through the high priests to find and to make use of means of carrying them out to choose as many army captains as he liked to make whatever choice he thought best to send ambassadors in his own name and in short to have the entire control of the war to his office there was no rightful successor indeed the post was only filled by the direct order of the deity on occasions of public emergency in ordinary times all the management of peace and war was vested in the captains of the tribes as i will shortly point out lastly all men between the ages of twenty and sixty were ordered to bear arms and form a citizen army owing allegiance not to its general-in-chief nor to the high priest but to religion and to god the army or the hosts were called the army of god or the hosts of god for this reason god was called by the hebrews the god of armies and the ark of the covenant was borne in the midst of the army in important battles when the safety or destruction of the whole people hung upon the issue so that the people might as it were see their king among them and put forth all their strength from these directions left by moses to his successors we plainly see that he chose administrators rather than despots to come after him for he invested no one with the power of consulting god where he liked and alone consequently no one had the power possessed by himself of ordaining and abrogating laws of deciding on war or peace of choosing men to fill offices both religious and secular all these are the prerogative of a sovereign the high priest indeed had the right of interpreting laws and communicating the answers of god but he could not do so when he liked as moses could but only when he was asked by the general-in-chief of the army the council or some similar authority the general-in-chief and the council could consult god when they liked but could only receive his answers through his high priest so that the utterances of god as reported by the high priest were not decrees as they were when reported by moses but only answers they were accepted by joshua and the council and only then had the force of commands and decrees the high priest both in the case of aaron and of his son eleazar was chosen by moses nor had any one after moses's death a right to elect to the office which became hereditary the general-in-chief of the army was also chosen by moses and assumed his functions in virtue of the commands not of the high priest but of moses indeed after the death of joshua the high priest did not appoint any one in his place and the captains did not consult god afresh about a general-in-chief but each retained joshua's power in respect to the contingent of his own tribe and all retained it collectively in respect to the whole army there seems to have been no need of a general-in-chief except when they were obliged to unite their forces against a common enemy this occurred most frequently during the time of joshua when they had no fixed dwelling place and possessed all things in common after all the tribes had gained their territories by right of conquest and had divided their allotted gains they became separated having no longer their possessions in common so that the need for a single commander ceased for the different tribes should be considered rather in the light of the confederated states than of bodies of fellow-citizens in respect to their god and their religion they were fellow-citizens but in respect to the rights which one possessed with regard to another they were only confederated they were in fact in much the same position if one accepts the temple common to all as the united states of the netherlands the division of property held in common is only another phrase for the possession of a share by each of the owners singly and the surrender by the others of their rights over such share 
This is why Moses elected captains of the tribes, namely, that when the dominion was divided, each might take care of his own part, consulting God through the high priest on the affairs of his tribe, ruling over his army, building and fortifying cities, appointing judges, attacking the enemies of his own dominion, and having complete control over all civil and military affairs. He was not bound to acknowledge any superior judge save God, or a prophet whom God should expressly send. If he departed from the worship of God, the rest of the tribes did not arraign him as a subject, but attacked him as an enemy. Of this we have examples in scriptures. When Joshua was dead, the children of Israel, not a fresh general-in-chief, consulted God. It being decided that the tribe of Judah should be the first to attack its enemies, the tribe in question contracted a single alliance with the tribe of Simeon for uniting their forces and attacking their common enemy, the rest of the tribes not being included in the alliance. Judges chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. Each tribe separately made war against its own enemies and, according to its pleasure, received them as subjects or allies, though it had been commanded not to spare them on any conditions, but to destroy them utterly. Such disobedience met with reproof from the rest of the tribes, but did not cause the offending tribe to be arraigned. It was not considered a sufficient reason for proclaiming a civil war or interfering in one another's affairs. But when the tribe of Benjamin offended against the others, and so loosened the bonds of peace that none of the confederated tribes could find refuge within its borders, they attacked it as an enemy, and gaining the victory over it after three battles, put to death both guilty and innocent, according to the laws of war, an act which they subsequently bewailed with tardy repentance. These examples plainly confirm what we have said concerning the rights of each tribe. Perhaps we shall be asked who elected the successors to the captains of each tribe. On this point I can gather no positive information in Scripture, but I conjecture that as the tribes were divided into families, each headed by its senior member, the senior of all these heads of families succeeded by right to the office of captain, for Moses chose from among these seniors his seventy coadjutors, who formed with himself the supreme council. Those who administered the government after the death of Joshua were called elders. An elder is a very common Hebrew expression in the sense of judge, as I suppose every one knows. However, it is not very important for us to make up our minds on this point. It is enough to have shown that after the death of Moses, no one wielded all the power of a sovereign, as affairs were not all managed by one man, nor by a single council, nor by the popular vote, but partly by one tribe, partly by the rest in equal shares. It is most evident that the government, after the death of Moses, was neither monarchic, nor aristocratic, nor popular, but as we have said, theocratic. End of section 18, read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 19 of A Theological-Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza, translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 17 continues. The reasons for applying this name are, 1. Because the royal seat of government was the temple, and in respect to it alone, as we have shown, all the tribes were fellow citizens. 2. Because all the people owed allegiance to God, their supreme judge, to whom only they had promised implicit obedience in all things. 3. Because the general-in-chief or dictator, when there was need of such, was elected by none save God alone. This was expressly commanded by Moses in the name of God, Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, and witnessed by the actual choice of Gideon, of Samson, and of Samuel. Wherefrom we may conclude that the other faithful leaders were chosen in the same manner, though it is not expressly told us. These preliminaries being stated, it is now time to inquire the effects of forming a dominion on this plan, and to see whether it so effectually kept within bounds both rulers and ruled, that the former were never tyrannical and the latter never rebellious. Those who administer or possess governing power always try to surround their high-handed actions with a cloak of legality, and to persuade the people that they act from good motives. This they are easily able to effect when they are the sole interpreters of the law, for it is evident that they are thus able to assume a far greater freedom to carry out their wishes and desires than if the interpretation of the law is vested in someone else, or if the laws were so self-evident that no one could be in doubt as to their meaning. We thus see that the power of evil doing was greatly curtailed for the Hebrew captains by the fact that the whole interpretation of the law was vested in the Levites, 
Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 5, who on their part had no share in the government and depended for all their support and consideration on a correct interpretation of the laws entrusted to them. Moreover, the whole people was commanded to come together at a certain place every seven years and be instructed in the law by the high priest. Further, each individual was bidden to read the book of the law through and through continually with scrupulous care. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verses 9 and chapter 6 verse 7. The captains were thus for their own sakes bound to take great care to administer everything according to the laws laid down and well known to all if they wished to be held in high honour by the people who would regard them as the administrators of God's dominion and as God's vice regents. Otherwise, they could not have escaped all the virulence of theological hatred. There was another very important check on the unbridled license of the captains, in the fact that the army was formed from the whole body of the citizens between the ages of twenty and sixty, without exception, and that the captains were not able to hire any foreign soldiery. This, I say, was very important, for it is well known that princes can oppress their peoples with the single aid of the soldiery in their pay. While there is nothing more formidable to them than the freedom of citizen soldiers who have established the freedom and glory of their country by their valour, their toil, and their blood. Thus Alexander, when he was about to make war on Darius a second time, after hearing the advice of Parmenio, did not chide him who gave the advice, but Polyspercon, who was standing by. For as Curtius says, chapter 4, verse 13, he did not venture to reproach Parmenio again after having shortly before reproved him too sharply. This freedom of the Macedonians, which he so dreaded, he was not able to subdue till after the number of captives enlisted in the army surpassed that of his own people. Then, but not till then, he gave rein to his anger, so long checked by the independence of his chief fellow countrymen. If this independence of citizen soldiers can restrain the princes of ordinary states who are wont to usurp the whole glory of victories, it must have been still more effectual against the Hebrew captains, whose soldiers were fighting not for the glory of a prince, but for the glory of God, and who did not go forth to battle till the divine asset had been given. We must also remember that the Hebrew captains were associated only by the bonds of religion. Therefore, if any one of them had transgressed and begun to violate the divine right, he might have been treated by the rest as an enemy and lawfully subdued. An additional check may be found in the fear of a new prophet arising, for if a man of unblemished life could show by certain signs that he was really a prophet, he ipso facto obtained the sovereign right to rule which was given to him, as to Moses formerly in the name of God, as revealed to himself alone not merely through the high priest as in the case of the captains. There is no doubt that such an one would easily be able to enlist an oppressed people in his cause, and by trifling signs persuade them of anything he wished. On the other hand, if affairs were well ordered, the captain would be able to make provision in time, that the prophet should be submitted to his approval, and be examined whether he were really of unblemished life, and possessed indisputable signs of his mission. Also, whether the teaching he proposed to set forth in the name of the Lord agreed with received doctrines and the general laws of the country. If his credentials were insufficient or his doctrines new, he could lawfully be put to death or else received on the captain's sole responsibility and authority. Again, the captains were not superior to the others in nobility or birth, but only administer the government in virtue of their age and personal qualities. Lastly, Neither captains nor army had any reason for preferring war to peace. The army, as we have stated, consisted entirely of citizens, so that affairs were managed by the same persons both in peace and war. The man who was a soldier in the camp was a citizen in the marketplace. He who was a leader in the camp was a judge in the law courts. He who was a general in the camp was a ruler in the state. Thus no one could desire war for its own sake, but only for the sake of preserving peace and liberty. Possibly the captains avoided change as far as possible, so as not to be obliged to consult the high priest and submit to the indignity of standing in his presence. So much for the precautions for keeping the captains within bounds. We must now look for the restraints upon the people. These, however, are very clearly indicated in the very groundwork of the social fabric. Anyone who gives the subject the slightest attention will see that the state was so ordered as to inspire the most ardent patriotism in the hearts of the citizens so that the latter would be very hard to persuade to betray their country, and be ready to endure anything rather than submit to a foreign yoke. After they had transferred their right to God, they thought that their kingdom belonged to God, and that they themselves were God's children. 
other nations they looked upon as god's enemies and regarded with intense hatred which they took to be piety see psalm 139 verses 21 and 22 nothing would have been more abhorrent to them than swearing allegiance to a foreigner and promising him obedience nor could they conceive any greater or more execrable crime than the betrayal of their country the kingdom of the god whom they adored it was considered wicked for any one to settle outside of the country inasmuch as the worship of god by which they were bound could not be carried on elsewhere their own land alone was considered holy the rest of the earth unclean and profane david who was forced to live in exile complained before saul as follows but if they be the children of men who have stirred thee up against me cursed be they before the lord for they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the lord saying go serve other gods first samuel chapter 26 verse 19 for the same reason no citizen as we should especially remark was ever sent into exile he who sinned was liable to punishment but not to disgrace thus the love of hebrews for their country was not only patriotism but also piety and was cherished and nurtured by daily rites till like their hatred of other nations it must have passed into their nature their daily worship was not only different from that of other nations as it might well be considering that they were a peculiar people and entirely apart from the rest it was absolutely contrary such daily reprobation naturally gave rise to a lasting hatred deeply implanted in the heart for of all hatreds none is more deep and tenacious than that which springs from extreme devoutness or piety and is itself cherished as pious nor was a general cause lacking for inflaming such hatred more and more inasmuch as it was reciprocated the surrounding nations regarding the jews with a hatred just as intense how great was the effect of all these causes namely freedom from man's dominion devotion to their country absolute rights over all other men a hatred not only permitted but pious a contempt for their fellow men the singularity of their customs and religious rites the effect i repeat of all these causes in strengthening the hearts of the jews to bear all things for their country with extraordinary constancy and valour will at once be discerned by reason and attested by experience never so long as the city was standing could they endure to remain under foreign dominion and therefore they called jerusalem a rebellious city ezra chapter four verse twelve their state after its re-establishment which was a mere shadow of the first for the high priest had usurped the rights of the tribal captains was with great difficulty destroyed by the romans as tacitus bears witness histories chapter two verse four vespasian had closed the war against the jews abandoning the siege of jerusalem as an enterprise difficult and arduous rather from the character of the people and the obstinacy of their superstition than from the strength left to the besieged for meeting their necessities but besides these characteristics which are merely ascribed by an individual opinion there was one feature peculiar to this state and of great importance in retaining the affections of the citizens and checking all thoughts of desertion or abandonment of the country namely self-interest the strength and life of all human action this was peculiarly engaged in the hebrew state for nowhere else did citizens possess their goods so securely as did the subjects of this community for the latter possessed as large a share in the land and the fields as did their chiefs and were owners of their plots of ground in perpetuity for if any man was compelled by poverty to sell his farm or his pasture he received it back again intact at the year of jubilee there were other similar enactments against the possibility of alienating real property again poverty was nowhere more endurable than in a country where duty towards one's neighbour that is one's fellow citizen was practised with the utmost piety as a means of gaining the favour of god the king thus the hebrew citizens would nowhere be so well off as in their own country outside its limits they met with nothing but loss and disgrace the following considerations were of weight not only in keeping them at home but also in preventing civil war and removing causes of strife no one was bound to serve as equal but only to serve god while charity and love towards fellow citizens was accounted the highest piety this last feeling was not a little fostered by the general hatred with which they regarded foreign nations and were regarded by them furthermore the strict discipline of obedience in which they were brought up was a very important factor for they were bound to carry on all their actions according to the set rules of the law a man might not plough when he liked but only at certain times in certain years and with one sort of beast at a time so too he might only sow and reap in a certain method and season 
in fact his whole life was one long school of obedience see chapter five on the use of ceremonies such a habit was thus engendered that conformity seemed freedom instead of servitude and men desired what was commanded rather than what was forbidden this result was not a little aided by the fact that the people were bound at certain seasons of the year to give themselves up to rest and rejoicing not for their own pleasure but in order that they might worship god cheerfully three times in the year they feasted before the lord on the seventh day of every week they were bidden to abstain from all work and to rest besides these there were other occasions when innocent rejoicing and feasting were not only allowed but enjoined i do not think any better means of influencing men's minds could be devised for there is no more powerful attraction than joy springing from devotion a mixture of admiration and love it was not easy to be wearied by constant repetition for the rites on the various festivals were varied and recurred seldom we may add the deep reverence for the temple which all most religiously fostered on account of the peculiar rites and duties that they were obliged to perform before approaching thither even now jews cannot read without horror of the crimes of manasseh who dared to place an idol in the temple the laws scrupulously preserved in the inmost sanctuary were objects of equal reverence to the people popular reports and misconceptions were therefore very little to be feared in this quarter for no one dared decide on sacred matters but all felt bound to obey without consulting their reason all the commands given by the answers of god received in the temple and all the laws which god had ordained i think i have now explained clearly though briefly the main feature of the hebrew commonwealth i must now inquire into the causes which led the people so often to fall away from the law which brought about their frequent subjection and finally the complete destruction of their dominion perhaps i shall be told that it sprang from their hardness of heart but this is childish for why should this people be more hard of heart than others was it by nature but nature forms individuals not peoples the latter are only distinguishable by the difference of their language their customs and their laws while from the two last that is customs and laws it may arise that they have a peculiar disposition a peculiar manner of life and peculiar prejudices if then the hebrews were harder of heart than other nations the fault lay with their laws or customs this is certainly true in the sense that if god had wished their dominion to be more lasting he would have given them other rights and laws and would have instituted a different form of government we can therefore only say that their god was angry with them not only as jeremiah says from the building of the city but even from the founding of their laws this is borne witness to by ezekiel chapter twenty verse twenty five wherefore i gave them also statutes that were not good and judgments whereby they should not live and i polluted them in their own gifts in that they caused to pass through the fire all that openeth the womb that i might make them desolate to the end that they might know that i am the lord in order that we may understand these words and the destruction of the hebrew commonwealth we must bear in mind that it had at first been intended to entrust the whole duties of the priesthood to the firstborn and not to the levites see numbers chapter eight verse seventeen it was only when all the tribes except the levites worshipped the golden calf that the firstborn were rejected and defiled and the levites chosen in their stead deuteronomy chapter ten verse eight when i reflect on this change i feel disposed to break forth with the words of tacitus god's object at that time was not the safety of the jews but vengeance i am greatly astonished that the celestial mind was so inflamed with anger that it ordained laws which always are supposed to promote the honor well-being and security of a people with the purpose of vengeance for the sake of punishment so that the laws do not seem so much laws that is the safeguard of the people as pains and penalties the gifts which the people were obliged to bestow on the levites and priests the redemption of the firstborn the poll tax due to the levites the privilege possessed by the latter of the sole performance of sacred rites all these i say were a continual reproach to the people a continual reminder of their defilement and rejection moreover we may be sure that the levites were for ever heaping reproaches upon them for among so many thousands there must have been many importunate dabblers in theology hence the people got into the way of watching the acts of the levites who were but human of accusing the whole body of the faults of one member and continually murmuring besides this there was the obligation to keep in idleness men hateful to them and connected by no ties of blood especially would this seem grievous when provisions were dear what wonder then if in times of peace when striking miracles had ceased and no man of paramount authority were forthcoming 
the irritable and greedy temper of the people began to wax cold and at length to fall away from a worship which though divine was also humiliating and even hostile and to seek after something fresh or can we be surprised that the captains who always adopt the popular course in order to gain the sovereign power for themselves by enlisting the sympathies of the people and alienating the high priest should have yielded to their demands and introduced a new worship if the state had been formed according to the original intention the rights and honour of all the tribes would have been equal and everything would have rested on a firm basis who is there who would willingly violate the religious rights of his kindred what could a man desire more than to support his own brothers and parents thus fulfilling the duties of religion who would not rejoice in being taught by them the interpretation of the laws and receiving through them the answers of god the tribes would thus have been united by a far closer bond if all alike had possessed a right to the priesthood all danger would have been obviated if the choice of the levites had not been dictated by anger and revenge but as we have said the hebrews had offended their god who, as Ezekiel says, polluted them in their own gifts by rejecting all that openeth the wound, so that he might destroy them. This passage is also confirmed by their history. As soon as the people in the wilderness began to live in ease and plenty, certain men of no mean birth began to rebel against the choice of the Levites, and to make it a cause for believing that Moses had not acted by the commands of God, but for his own good pleasure, inasmuch as he had chosen his own tribe before all the rest, and had bestowed the high priesthood in perpetuity of his own brother they therefore stirred up a tumult and came to him crying out that all men were equally sacred and that he had exalted himself above his fellows wrongfully moses was not able to pacify them with reasons but with the intervention of a miracle in proof of the faith they all perished a fresh sedition then arose among the whole people who believed that their champions had not been put to death by the judgment of god but by the device of moses after a great slaughter or pestilence the rising subsided from inanition but in such a manner that all preferred death to life under such conditions we should rather say that sedition ceased than that harmony was re-established this is witnessed by scripture deuteronomy chapter thirty one verse twenty one where god after predicting to moses that the people after his death will fall away from the divine worship speaks thus for I know their imagination which they go about, even now before I have brought them into the land which I swear. And a little while after, chapter 31, verse 27, Moses says, For I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have been rebellious against the Lord, and how much more after my death. Indeed, it happened according to his words, as we all know. Great changes, extreme license, luxury, and hardness of heart grew up. Things went from bad to worse, till at last the people, after being frequently conquered, came to an open rupture with the divine right, and wished for a mortal king, so that the seat of government might be the court instead of the temple, and that the tribes might remain fellow citizens in respect to their king, instead of in respect to divine right and the high priesthood. The vast material for new seditions was thus produced, eventually resulting in the ruin of the entire state. Kings are above all things jealous of a precarious rule, and can in no wise brook a dominion within their own. The first monarchs, being chosen from the ranks of private citizens, were content with the amount of dignity to which they had risen. But their sons, who obtained the throne by right of inheritance, began gradually to introduce changes, so as to get all the sovereign rights into their own hands. This they were generally unable to accomplish, so long as the right of legislation did not rest with them, but with the high priest, who kept the laws in the sanctuary, and interpreted them to the people. The kings were thus bound to obey the laws as much as were the subjects, and were unable to abrogate them, or to ordain new laws of equal authority. Moreover, they were prevented by the Levites from administering the affairs of religion, king and subject being alike unclean. Lastly, the whole safety of their dominion depended on the will of one man, if that man appeared to be a prophet, and of this they had seen an example, namely, how completely Samuel had been able to command Saul, and how easily because of a single disobedience, he had been able to transfer the right of sovereignty to David. Thus the kings found a dominion within their own and wielded a precarious sovereignty. In order to surmount these difficulties, they allowed other temples to be dedicated to the gods, so that there might be no further need of consulting the Levites. They also sought out many who prophesied in the name of God, so that they might have creatures of their own to oppose the true prophets. However, in spite of all their attempts they never attained their end for the prophets prepared against every emergency 
waited for a favorable opportunity, such as the beginning of a new reign, which is always precarious, while the memory of the previous reign remains green. At these times they could easily pronounce by divine authority that the king was tyrannical, and could produce a champion of distinguished virtue to vindicate the divine right, and lawfully to claim dominion or a share in it. Still, not even so could the prophets effect much. They could indeed remove a tyrant, but there were reasons which prevented them from doing more than setting up, at a great cost of civil bloodshed, another tyrant in his stead. Of discords and civil wars there was no end, for the causes for the violation of divine right remained always the same, and could only be removed by a complete remodelling of the state. We have now seen how religion was introduced into the Hebrew commonwealth, and how the dominion might have lasted for ever, if the just wrath of the lawgiver had allowed it. As this was impossible, it was bound in time to perish. I am now speaking only of the first commonwealth, for the second was a mere shadow of the first, inasmuch as the people were bound by the rights of the Persians to whom they were subject. After the restoration of freedom, the high priests usurped the rights of the secular chiefs, and thus obtained absolute dominion. The priests were inflamed with an intense desire to wield the powers of the sovereignty and the high priesthood at the same time. I have, therefore, no need to speak further of the second commonwealth. Whether the first, in so far as we deem it to have been durable, is capable of imitation, and whether it would be pious to copy it as far as possible, will appear from what follows. I wish only to draw attention as a crowning conclusion to the principle indicated already, namely, that it is evident from what we have stated in this chapter, that the divine right or the right of religion originates in a compact. Without such compact, none but natural rights exist. The Hebrews were not bound by their religion to evince any pious care for other nations not included in the compact, but only for their fellow citizens. End of section 19. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 20 of A Theological Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza. Translated by Robert Harvey Monroe Elvis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 18. From the Commonwealth of the Hebrews and their History, Certain Political Doctrines are Deduced. Although the Commonwealth of the Hebrews, as we have conceived it, might have lasted forever, it would be impossible to imitate it at the present day, nor would it be advisable to do so. If a people wished to transfer their rights to God, it would be necessary to make an express covenant with Him, and for this would be needed not only the consent of those transferring their rights, but also the consent of God. God, however, has revealed through His apostles that the covenant of God is no longer written in ink or on tables of stone, but with the Spirit of God in the fleshy tables of the heart. Furthermore, such a form of government would only be available for those who desire to have no foreign relations, but to shut themselves up within their own frontiers and to live apart from the rest of the world. It would be useless to men who must have dealings with other nations, so that the cases where it could be adopted are very few indeed. Nevertheless, though it could not be copied in its entirety, it possessed many excellent features which might be brought to our notice, and perhaps imitated with advantage. My intention, however, is not to write a treatise on forms of government, so I will pass over most of such points in silence, and will only touch on those which bear upon my purpose. God's kingdom is not infringed upon by the choice of an earthly ruler endowed with sovereign rights, for after the Hebrews had transferred their rights to God, they conferred the sovereign right of ruling on Moses, investing him with the sole power of instituting and abrogating laws in the name of God, of choosing priests, of judging, of teaching, of punishing, in fact, all the prerogatives of an absolute monarch. Again, though, the priests were interpreters of the laws. They had no power to judge the citizens or to excommunicate anyone. This could only be done by the judges and chiefs chosen from among the people. A consideration of the successes and the histories of the Hebrews will bring to light other considerations worthy of note. To wit, one, that there were no religious sects till after the high priests in the second commonwealth possessed the authority to make decrees and transact the business of government. In order that such authority might last for ever, the high priests usurped the rights of secular rulers and at last wished to be styled kings. The reason for this is ready to hand. In the first commonwealth no decree could bear the name of the high priest, for he had no right to ordain laws, 
but only to give the answers of God to questions asked by the captains or the councils. He had therefore no motive for making changes in the law, but took care, on the contrary, to administer and guard what had already been received and accepted. His only means of preserving his freedom and safety against the will of the captains lay in cherishing the law intact. After the high priests had assumed the power of carrying on the government, and added the rights of secular rulers to those they already possessed, each one began, both in things religious and in things secular, to seek for the glorification of his own name, settling everything by sacerdotal authority, and issuing every day concerning ceremonies, faith, and all else, new decrees which he sought to make as sacred and authoritative as the laws of Moses. Religion thus sank into a degrading superstition, while the true meaning and interpretation of the laws became corrupted. Furthermore, while the high priests were paving their way to the secular rule just after the restoration, they attempted to gain popular favor by assenting to every demand, approving whatever the people did, however impious, and accommodating scripture to the very depraved current morals. Malachi bears witness to this in no measured terms. He chides the priests of his time as despisers of the name of God, and then goes on with his invective as follows, Malachi chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. He further accuses them of interpreting the laws according to their own pleasure, and paying no respect to God, but only to persons. It is certain that the high priests were never so cautious in their conduct as to escape the remark of the more shrewd among the people, for the latter were at length emboldened to assert that no laws ought to be kept save those that were written, and that the decrees which the Pharisees, consisting as Josephus says in his antiquities, chiefly of the common people, were deceived into calling the traditions of the fathers should not be observed at all. However this may be, we can in no wise doubt that flattery of the high priest, the corruption of religion and the laws, and the enormous increase of the extent of the last name, gave a very great and frequent occasion for disputes and altercations impossible to allay. When men begin to quarrel with all the ardor of superstition, and the magistracy to back up one side or the other, they can never come to a compromise, but are bound to split into sects. It is worthy of remark that the prophets who were in a private station of life rather irritated than reformed mankind by their freedom of warning, rebuke, and censure, whereas the kings, by their reproofs and punishments, could always produce an effect. The prophets were often intolerable even to pious kings, on account of the authority they assumed for judging whether an action was right or wrong, or for reproving the kings themselves if they dared to transact any business, whether public or private, without a prophetic sanctum. King Asa, who, according to the testimony of Scripture, reigned piously, put the prophet Hanani into a prison house because he had ventured freely to chide and reprove him for entering into a covenant with the king of Armenia. Other examples might be cited, tending to prove that a religion gained more harm than good by such freedom, not to speak of the further consequence that if the prophets had retained their rights, great civil wars would have resulted. 3. It is remarkable that during all the period during which the people held the reins of power, there was only one civil war, and that one was completely extinguished, the conquerors taking such pity on the conquered, that they endeavored in every way to reinstate them in their former dignity and power. But after that, the people, little accustomed to kings, changed its first form of government into a monarchy. Civil war raged almost continuously, and battles were so fierce as to exceed all others recorded. In one engagement, taxing our faith to the utmost, 500,000 Israelites were slaughtered by the men of Judah, and in another, the Israelites slew great numbers of men of Judah. The figures are not given in Scripture, almost razed to the ground the walls of Jerusalem, and sacked the temple in their unbridled fury. At length, laden with the spoils of their brethren, satiated with blood, they took hostages, and leaving the king in his well-nigh devastated kingdom, laid down their arms, relying on the weakness rather than the good faith of their foes. A few years after, the men of Judah, with recruited strength, again took the field, but were a second time beaten by the Israelites, and slain to the number of a hundred and twenty thousand. 
two hundred thousand of their wives and children were led into captivity, and a great booty again seized. Worn out with these and similar battles set forth at length in their histories, the Jews at length fell a prey to their enemies. Furthermore, if we reckon up the times during which peace prevailed under each form of government, we shall find a great discrepancy. Before the monarchy forty years and more often passed, and once eighty years, an almost unparalleled period, without any war, foreign or civil. After the kings acquired sovereign power, the fighting was no longer for peace and liberty, but for glory. Accordingly, we find that they all, with the exception of Solomon, whose virtue and wisdom would be better displayed in peace than in war, waged war, and finally a fatal desire for power gained ground, which in many cases made the path to the throne a bloody one. Lastly, the laws during the rule of the people remained uncorrupted and were studiously observed. Before the monarchy, there were very few prophets to admonish the people. But after the establishment of kings, there were a great number at the same time. Obadiah saved a hundred from death and hid them away, lest they should be slain with the rest. The people, so far as we can see, were never deceived by false prophets till after the power had been vested in kings, whose creatures many of the prophets were. Again, the people whose heart was generally proud or humble, according to its circumstances, easily corrected itself under misfortune, turned again to God, restored his laws, and so freed itself from all peril. But the kings whose hearts were always equally puffed up, and who could not be corrected without humiliation, clung pertinaciously to their vices, even till the last overthrow of the city. We may now clearly see from what I have said, 1. How hurtful to religion and the state is the concession to ministers of religion of any power of issuing decrees or transacting the business of government. How, on the contrary, far greater stability is afforded if the said ministers are only allowed to give answers to questions duly put to them and are, as a rule, obliged to preach and practice the received and accepted doctrines. 2. How dangerous it is to refer to divine right matters merely speculative and subject or liable to dispute. The most tyrannical governments are those which make crimes of opinions, for every one has an inalienable right over his thoughts, nay, such a state of things leads to the rule of popular passion. Pontius Pilate made concession to the passion of the Pharisees in consenting to the crucifixion of Christ, whom he knew to be innocent. Again, the Pharisees, in order to shake the position of men richer than themselves, began to set on foot questions of religion and accuse the Sadducees of impiety and, following their example, the vilest hypocrites, stirred as they pretended, by the same holy wrath which they called zeal for the Lord, persecuted men whose unblemished character and distinguished virtue had excited the popular hatred, publicly denounced their opinions, and inflamed the fierce passions of the people against them. This wanton license, being cloaked with a specious garb of religion, could not easily be repressed, especially when the sovereign authorities introduced a sect of which they were not the head. They were then regarded not as interpreters of divine right, but as sectarians, that is, as persons recognizing the right of divine interpretation assumed by the leaders of the sect. The authority of the magistrates thus became of little account in such matters in comparison with the authority of sectarian leaders, before whose interpretations kings were obliged to bow. To avoid such evils in a state, there is no safer way than to make piety and religion to consist in acts only that is, in the practice of justice and charity, leaving every one's judgment in other respects free. But I will speak of this more at length presently. 3. We see how necessary it is, both in the interests of the state and the interests of religion, to confer on the sovereign power the right of deciding what is lawful or the reverse. If this right of judging actions could not be given to the very prophets of God without great injury to the state and religion, how much less should it be entrusted to those who can neither foretell the future nor work miracles. But this again I will treat of more fully hereafter. For, lastly, we see how disastrous it is for a people unaccustomed to kings and possessing a complete code of laws to set up a monarchy. Neither can the subjects brook such a sway, nor the royal authority submit to laws and popular rights set up by anyone inferior to itself. Still less can a king be expected to defend such laws, for they were not framed to support his dominion, but the dominion of the people, or some council which formerly ruled, so that, in guarding the popular rights, the king would seem to be a slave rather than a master. 
the representative of a new monarchy will employ all his zeal in attempting to frame new laws so as to wrest the rights of dominion to his own use and to reduce the people till they find it easier to increase than to curtail the royal prerogative i must not however omit to state that it is no less dangerous to remove a monarch though he is on all hands admitted to be a tyrant for his people are accustomed to royal authority and will obey no other despising and mocking at any less august control it is therefore necessary as the prophets discovered of old if one king be removed that he should be replaced by another who will be a tyrant from necessity rather than choice for how will he be able to endure the sight of the hands of the citizens reeking with royal blood and to rejoice in their regicide as a glorious exploit was not the deed perpetrated as an example and warning for himself if he really wishes to be king and not to acknowledge the people as the judge of kings and the master of himself or to wield a precarious sway he must avenge the death of his predecessor making an example for his own sake lest the people should venture to repeat a similar crime he will not however be able easily to avenge the death of the tyrant by the slaughter of citizens unless he defends the cause of tyranny and approves the deeds of his predecessor thus following in his footstep hence it comes to pass that people have often changed their tyrants but never removed them or changed the monarchical form of government into any other the english people furnish us with a terrible example of this fact they sought how to depose their monarch under the forms of law but when he had been removed they were utterly unable to change the form of government and after much bloodshed only brought it about that a new monarch should be hailed under a different name as though it had been a mere question of names this new monarch could only consolidate his power by completely destroying the royal stock putting to death the king's friends real or supposed and disturbing with war the peace which might encourage discontent in order that the populace might be engrossed with novelties and divert its mind from brooding over the slaughter of the king at last however the people reflected that it had accomplished nothing for the good of the country beyond violating the rights of the lawful king and changing everything for the worse it therefore decided to retrace its step as soon as possible and never rested till it had seen a complete restoration of the original state of affairs it may perhaps be objected that the roman people was easily able to remove its tyrants but i gather from its history a strong confirmation of my contention though the roman people was much more than ordinarily capable of removing their tyrants and changing their forms of government inasmuch as it held in its own hands the power of eliciting its king and its successor and being composed of rebels and criminals had not long been used to the royal yoke out of its six kings it had put to death three nevertheless it could accomplish nothing beyond electing several tyrants in place of one who kept it groaning under a continual state of war both foreign and civil till at last it changed its government again to a form differing from monarchy as in england only in name as for the united states of the netherlands they have never as we know had a king but only counts who never attained the full rights of dominion the states of the netherlands evidently acted as principals in the settlement made by them at the time of the earl of leicester's mission they always reserve for themselves the authority to keep the counts up to their duties and the power to preserve this authority and the liberty of their citizens they had ample means of vindicating their rights if their rulers should prove tyrannical and could impose such restraints that nothing could be done without their consent and approval thus the rights of sovereign power have always been vested in the states though the last count endeavoured to usurp them it is therefore little likely that the states should give them up especially as they have just restored their original dominion lately almost lost these examples then confirm us in our belief that every dominion should retain its original form and indeed cannot change it without danger of the utter ruin of the whole state such are the points i have here thought worthy of remark end of section 20 read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama Section 21 of A Theological-Political Treatise by Baruch Benedict de Spinoza Translated by Robert Harvey Munro Elvis This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Chapter 19 It is shown that the right over matters spiritual lies wholly with the sovereign, and that the outward forms of religion should be in accordance with public peace, if we would obey God aright. 
When I have said that the possessors of sovereign power have rights over everything, and that all rights are dependent on their decree, I did not merely mean temporal rights, but also spiritual rights. Of the latter, no less than the former, they ought to be the interpreters and the champions. I wish to draw special attention to this point, and to discuss it fully in this chapter, because many persons deny that the right of deciding religious questions belongs to the sovereign power, and refuse to acknowledge it as the interpreter of divine right. They accordingly assume full license to accuse and arraign it, nay, even to excommunicate it from the church, as Ambrosius treated the emperor Theodosius in old time. However, I will show later on in this chapter that they take this means of dividing the government and paving the way to their own ascendancy. I wish, however, first to point out that religion acquires its force as law solely from the decrees of the sovereign. God has no special kingdom among men except in so far as he reigns through temporal rulers. Moreover, the rights of religion and the outward observances of piety should be in accordance with the public peace and well-being, and should therefore be determined by the sovereign power alone. I speak here only of the outward observances of piety and the external rites of religion, not of piety itself, nor of the inward worship of God, nor the means by which the mind is inwardly led to do homage to God in singleness of heart. Inward worship of God and piety in itself are within the sphere of everyone's private rights and cannot be alienated, as I show at the end of chapter 7. What I here mean by the kingdom of God is, I think, sufficiently clear from what has been said in chapter 14. I there showed that a man best fulfills God's laws who worships him, according to his command, through acts of justice and charity. It follows, therefore, that wherever justice and charity have the force of law and ordinance, there is God's kingdom. I recognize no difference between the cases where God teaches and commands the practice of justice and charity through our natural faculties and those where he makes special revelations. Nor is the form of the revelation of importance so long as such practice is revealed and becomes a sovereign and supreme law to man. If, therefore, I show that justice and charity can only acquire the force of right and law through the rights of rulers, I shall be able readily to arrive at the conclusion seeing that the rights of rulers are in the possession of the sovereign, that religion can only acquire the force of right by means of those who have the right to command, and that God only rules among men through the instrumentality of earthly potentates. It follows from what has been said that the practice of justice and charity only acquires the force of law through the rights of the sovereign authority. For we showed in chapter 16 that in the state of nature reason has no more rights than desire, but that men living either by the laws of the former or the laws of the latter possess rights coextensive with their powers. For this reason, we could not conceive sin to exist in the state of nature, nor imagine God as a judge punishing man's transgressions. But we supposed all things to happen according to the general laws of universal nature, there being no difference between pious and impious, between him that was pure, as Solomon says, and him that was impure because there was no possibility either of justice or charity. In order that the true doctrines of reason, that is, as we showed in chapter 4, the true divine doctrine, might obtain absolutely the force of law and right, it was necessary that each individual should cede his natural right and transfer it either to society as a whole, or to certain body of men, or to one man. Then, and not till then, does it first dawn upon us what is justice and what is injustice, what is equity and what is iniquity. Justice, therefore, and absolutely all the precepts of reason, including love towards one's neighbor, receive the force of laws and ordinances solely through the rights of dominion, that is, as we showed in the same chapter, solely on the decree of those who possess the right to rule. Inasmuch as the kingdom of God consists entirely in rights applied to justice and charity or to true religion, it follows that, as we asserted, the kingdom of God can only exist among men through the means of the sovereign powers. Nor does it make any difference whether religion be apprehended by our natural faculties or by revelation. The argument is sound in both cases. Inasmuch as religion is one and the same and is equally revealed by God, whatever the manner in which it becomes known to men. Thus, in order that the religion revealed by the prophets might have the force of law among the Jews, it was necessary that every man of them should yield up his natural right, and that all should, with one accord, 
agree that they would only obey such commands as God should reveal to them through the prophets. Just as we have showed to take place in a democracy, where men with one consent agree to live according to the dictates of reason, although the Hebrews furthermore transferred their right to God, they were able to do so rather in theory than in practice. For, as a matter of fact, as we pointed out above, they absolutely retained the right of dominion till they transferred it to Moses, who in his turn became absolute king, so that it was only through him that God reigned over the Hebrews. For this reason, namely, that religion only acquires the force of law by means of sovereign power, Moses was not able to punish those who, before the covenant, and consequently, while still in possession of their rights, violated the Sabbath. Exodus chapter 16, verse 27 but was able to do so after the covenant, Numbers, chapter 15, verse 36, because everyone had then yielded up his natural rights, and the ordinance of the Sabbath had received the force of law. Lastly, for the same reason, after the destruction of the Hebrew dominion, revealed religion ceased to have the force of law. For we cannot doubt that as soon as the Jews transferred their right to the king of Babylon, the kingdom of God and the divine right forthwith ceased. For the covenant wherewith they promised to obey all the utterances of God was abrogated. God's kingdom, which was based thereupon, also ceased. The Hebrews could no longer abide thereby, inasmuch as their rights no longer belonged to them, but to the king of Babylon, whom, as we showed in chapter 16, they were bound to obey in all things. Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 7, expressly admonishes them of this fact. And seek the peace of the city whither I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. Now they could not seek the peace of the city as having a share in its government, but only as slaves, being as they were captives. By obedience in all things, with a view to avoiding seditions, and by observing all the laws of the country, however different from their own, it is thus abundantly evident that religion among the Hebrews only acquired the form of law through the right of the sovereign rule. When that rule was destroyed, it could no longer be received as the law of a particular kingdom, but only as the universal precept of reason. I say of reason, for the universal religion had not yet become known by revelation. We may therefore draw the general conclusion that religion, whether revealed through our natural faculties or through prophets, receives the force of a command solely through the decrees of the holders of sovereign power, and further, that God has no special kingdom among men except in so far as he reigns through earthly potentates. We may now see in a clearer light what was stated in chapter 4, namely, that all the decrees of God involve eternal truth and necessity, so that we cannot conceive God as a prince or legislator giving laws to mankind. For this reason, the divine precepts, whether revealed through our natural faculties or through prophets, do not receive immediately from God the force of a command, but only from those or through the mediation of those who possess the right of ruling and legislating. It is only through these latter means that God rules among men and directs human affairs with justice and equity. This conclusion is supported by experience, for we find traces of divine justice only in places where just men bear sway. Elsewhere, the same lot, to repeat again Solomon's words, befalls the just and the unjust, the pure and the impure. A state of things which causes divine providence to be doubted by many who think that God immediately reigns among men and directs all nature for their benefit. As then both reason and experience tell us that the divine right is entirely dependent on the decrees of secular rulers, it follows that secular rulers are its proper interpreters. How this is so we shall now see. For it is time to show that the outward observances of religion and all the external practices of piety should be brought into accordance with the public peace and well-being, it would obey God rightly. When this has been shown, we shall easily understand how the sovereign rulers are the proper interpreters of religion and piety. It is certain that duties towards one's country are the highest that man can fulfill. For if government be taken away, no good thing can last, all falls into dispute, anger and anarchy reign unchecked amid universal fear. Consequently, there can be no duty towards our neighbor which would not become an offense if it involved injury to the whole state, nor can there be any offense against our duty towards our neighbor or anything but loyalty in what we do for the sake of preserving the state. 
for instance it is in the abstract my duty when my neighbor quarrels with me and wishes to take my cloak to give him my coat also but if it be thought that such conduct is hurtful to the maintenance of the state i ought to bring him to trial even at the risk of his being condemned to death for this reason manlius turcatius is held up to honour inasmuch as the public welfare outweighed with him his duty towards his children this being so it follows that the public welfare is a sovereign law to which all others divine and human should be made to conform now it is the function of the sovereign only to decide what is necessary for the public welfare and the safety of the state and to give orders accordingly therefore it is also the function of the sovereign only to decide the limits of our duty towards our neighbour in other words to determine how we should obey god we can now clearly understand how the sovereign is the interpreter of religion and further that no one can obey god rightly if the practices of his piety do not confirm to the public welfare or consequently if he does not implicitly obey all the commands of the sovereign for as by god's command we are bound to do our duty to all men without exception and to do no man an injury we are also bound not to help one man at another's loss still less at a loss to the whole state now no private citizen can know what is good for the state except he learn it through the sovereign power who alone has a right to transact public business therefore no one can rightly practise piety or obedience to god unless he obey the sovereign power's commands in all things this proposition is confirmed by the facts of experience for if the sovereign adjudge a man to be worthy of death or an enemy whether he be a citizen or a foreigner a private individual or a separate ruler no subject is allowed to give him assistance so also though the jews were bidden to love their fellow citizens as themselves leviticus chapter nineteen verses seventeen and eighteen they were nevertheless bound if a man offended against the law to point him out to the judge leviticus chapter five verse one and deuteronomy chapter thirteen verses eight and nine and if he should be condemned to death to slay him deuteronomy chapter seventeen verse seven further in order that the hebrews might preserve the liberty they had gained and might retain absolute sway over the territory they had conquered it was necessary as we showed in chapter seventeen that their religion should be adapted to their particular government and that they should separate themselves from the rest of the nations wherefore it was commanded to them love thy neighbour and hate thine enemy matthew chapter five verse forty three but after they had lost their dominion and had gone into captivity in babylon jeremiah bid them take thought for the safety of the state into which they had been led captive and christ when he saw that they would be spread over the whole world told them to do their duty by all men without exception all of which instances show that religion has always been made to conform to the public welfare perhaps someone will ask by what right then did the disciples of christ being private citizens preach a new religion i answer that they did so by the right of the power which they had received from christ against unclean spirits see matthew chapter ten verse one i have already stated in chapter sixteen that all are bound to obey a tyrant unless they have received from god through undoubted revelation a promise of aid against him so let no one take example from the apostles unless he too has the power of working miracles the point is brought out more clearly by christ's command to his disciples fear not those who kill the body matthew chapter ten verse twenty eight if this command were imposed on every one governments would be founded in vain and solomon's words proverbs chapter twenty four verse twenty one my son fear god and the king would be impious which they certainly are not we must therefore admit that the authority which christ gave to his disciples was given to them only and must not be taken as an example for others i do not pause to consider the arguments of those who wish to separate secular rights from spiritual rights placing the former under the control of the sovereign and the latter under the control of the universal church such pretensions are too frivolous to merit refutation i cannot however pass over in silence the fact that such persons are woefully deceived when they seek to support their seditious opinions i ask pardon for the somewhat harsh epithet by the example of the jewish high priest who in ancient times had the right of administering the sacred offices did not the high priests receive their right by the decree of moses who as i have shown retained the sole right to rule and could they not by the same means be deprived of it moses himself chose not only aaron but also his son eleazar and his grandson phineas and bestowed on them the right of administering the office of high priest 
This right was retained by the high priests afterwards, but nonetheless were they delegates of Moses, that is, of the sovereign power. Moses, as we have shown, left no successor to his dominion, but so distributed his prerogatives that those who came after him seemed, as it were, regents who administer the government when a king is absent but not dead. In the second commonwealth, the high priests held their right absolutely, after they had obtained the rights of principality in addition. Wherefore, the rights of the high priesthood always depended on the edict of the sovereign, and the high priests did not possess them till they became sovereigns also. Rights in matters spiritual always remained under the control of the kings absolutely, as I will show at the end of this chapter, except in the single particular that they were not allowed to administer in person the sacred duties in the temple, inasmuch as they were not of the family of Aaron, and were therefore considered unclean, a reservation which would have no force in a Christian community. We cannot therefore doubt that the daily sacred rites, whose performance does not require a particular genealogy, but only a special mode of life, and from which the holders of sovereign power are not excluded as unclean, are under the sole control of the sovereign power. No one, save by the authority or concession of such sovereign, has a right or power of administering them, of choosing others to administer them, of defining or strengthening the foundations of the church and her doctrines, of judging on questions of morality or acts of piety, of receiving any one into the church or excommunicating him therefrom, or, lastly, of providing for the poor. These doctrines are proved to be not only true, as we have already pointed out, but also of primary necessity for the preservation of religion and the state. We all know what weight spiritual right and authority carries in the popular mind, how every one hangs on the lips, as it were, of those who possess it. We may even say that those who wield such authority have the most complete sway over the popular mind. Whosoever, therefore, wishes to take this right away from the sovereign power is desirous of dividing the dominion, from such division, contentions and strife will necessarily spring up, as they did of old between the Jewish kings and high priests, and will defy all attempts to allay them. Nay, further, he who strives to deprive the sovereign power of such authority is aiming, as we have said, at gaining dominion for himself. What is left for the sovereign power to decide on, if this right be denied him? Certainly nothing concerning either war or peace. If he has to ask another man's opinion as to whether what he believes to be beneficial would be pious or impious, everything would depend on the verdict of him who has the right of deciding and judging what was pious or impious, right or wrong. When such a right was bestowed on the Pope of Rome, absolutely, he gradually acquired complete control over the kings till at last he himself mounted to the summits of dominion. However much monarchs, and especially the German emperors, strove to curtail his authority, were it only by a hair's breadth they affected nothing, but on the contrary, by their very endeavours, largely increased it. That which no monarch could accomplish with fire and sword, ecclesiastics could bring about with a stroke of the pen, whereby we may easily see the force and power at the command of the church, and also how necessary it is for sovereigns to reserve such prerogatives for themselves. If we reflect on what was said in the last chapter, we shall see that such a reservation conduced not a little to the increase of religion and piety, for we observed that the prophets themselves, though gifted with divine efficacy, being merely private citizens, rather irritated than reformed the people by their freedom of warning, reproof, and denunciation, whereas the kings, by warnings and punishments, easily bent men to their will. Furthermore, the kings themselves, not possessing the right in question absolutely, very often fell away from religion and took with them nearly the whole people. The same thing has often happened from the same cause in Christian states. Perhaps I shall be asked, but if the holders of sovereign power chose to be wicked, who will be the rightful champions of piety? Should the sovereigns still be its interpreters? I meet them with a the counter-question. But if ecclesiastics, who are also human, and private citizens, and who ought to mind only their own affairs, or if others, whom it be proposed to entrust with spiritual authority, choose to be wicked, should they still be considered as piety's rightful interpreters? It is quite certain that when sovereigns wish to follow their own pleasure, whether they have control over spiritual matters or not, the whole state, spiritual and secular, will go to ruin, and it will go much faster if private citizens seditiously assume the championship of the divine rights. Thus we see that not only is nothing gained by denying such rights to sovereigns, but on the contrary great evil ensues. For, as happened with the Jewish kings who did not possess such rights absolutely, rulers are thus driven into wickedness, and the injury and loss to the state become certain and inevitable, 
instead of uncertain and possible. Whether we look to the abstract truth or the security of states or the increase of piety, we are compelled to maintain that the divine right or the right of control over spiritual matters depends absolutely on the decree of the sovereign who is its legitimate interpreter and champion. Therefore the true ministers of God's word are those who teach piety to the people in obedience to the authority of the sovereign rulers by whose decree it has been brought into conformity with the public welfare. There remains for me to point out the cause for the frequent disputes on the subject of these spiritual rights in Christian states, whereas the Hebrews, so far as I know, never had any doubts about the matter. It seems monstrous that a question so plain and so vitally important should thus have remained undecided, and that the secular rulers could never attain the prerogative without controversy, nay, not without great danger of sedition and injury to religion. If no cause for the state of things were forthcoming, I could easily persuade myself that all I have said in this chapter is mere theorizing, or a kind of speculative reasoning which can never be of any practical use. However, when we reflect on the beginnings of Christianity, the cause at once becomes manifest. The Christian religion was not taught at first by kings, but by private persons, who, against the wishes of those in power, whose subjects they were, were for a long time accustomed to hold meetings in secret churches, to institute and perform sacred rites, and on their own authority to settle and decide on their affairs without regard to the state. When after the lapse of many years the religion was taken up by the authorities, the ecclesiastics were obliged to teach it to the emperors themselves as they had defined it. Wherefore, they easily gained recognition as its teachers and interpreters, and the church pastors were looked upon as vicars of God. The ecclesiastics took good care that the Christian kings should not assume their authority by prohibiting marriage to the chief ministers of religion and to its highest interpreter. They furthermore effected their purpose by multiplying the dogmas of religion to such an extent, and so blending them with philosophy, that their chief interpreter was bound to be a skilled philosopher and theologian, and to have leisure for a host of idle speculations, conditions which could only be fulfilled by a private individual with much time on his hands. Among the Hebrews things were very differently arranged, for their church began at the same time as their dominion, and Moses, their absolute ruler, taught religion to the people, arranged their sacred rites, and chose their spiritual ministers. Thus the royal authority carried very great weight with the people, and the kings kept a firm hold on their spiritual prerogatives. Although after the death of Moses no one held absolute sway, yet the power of deciding both in matters spiritual and matters temporal was in the hands of the secular chief, as I have already pointed out. Further, in order that it might be taught religion and piety, the people were bound to consult the supreme judge no less than the high priest. Deuteronomy chapter 17 verses 9 and 11. Lastly, though the kings had not as much power as Moses, nearly the whole arrangement and choice of the sacred ministry depended on their decision. Thus David arranged the whole service of the temple. See First Chronicles chapter 28 verses 11 and 12, etc. From all the Levites he chose 24,000 for the sacred psalms, 6,000 of these formed the body from which were chosen the judges and praetors, 4,000 were porters, and 4,000 to play on instruments. See First Chronicles chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. He further divided them into companies, of whom he chose the chiefs, so that each in rotation at the allotted time might perform the sacred rites. The priests he also divided into as many companies. I will not go through the whole catalogue, but refer the reader to Second Chronicles chapter 8 verse 13, where it is stated, Then Solomon offered burnt offerings to the Lord, after a certain rate every day, offering according to the commandments of Moses, and in verse 14, And he appointed, according to the order of David his father, the courses of the priests to their service. For so had David the man of God commanded. Lastly, the historian bears witness in verse 15, and they departed not from the commandment of the king unto the priests and Levites concerning any matter or concerning the treasuries. From these and other histories of the kings, it is abundantly evident that the whole practice of religion and the sacred ministry depended entirely on the commands of the king. When I said above that the kings had not the same right as Moses to elect the high priest, to consult God without intermediaries, and to condemn the prophets who prophesied during their reign, I said so simply, because the prophets could, in virtue of their mission, choose a new king and give absolution for regicide, not because they could call a king who offended against the law to judgment, or could rightly act against him. Wherefore, if there had been no prophet, 
who in virtue of a special revelation could give absolution for regicide the kings would have possessed absolute rights over all matters both spiritual and temporal consequently the rulers of modern times who have no prophets and would not rightly be bound in any case to receive them for they are not subject to jewish law have absolute possession of the spiritual prerogative although they are not celibates and they will always retain it if they will refuse to allow religious dogmas to be unduly multiplied or confounded with philosophy end of section 21 read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama section 22 of a theological political treatise by baruch benedict de spinoza translated by robert harvey monroe elvis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain read for you by chiquito crasto chapter 20 that in a free state every man may think what he likes and say what he thinks if men's minds were as easily controlled as their tongues every king would sit safely on his throne and government by compulsion would cease for every subject would shape his life according to the intentions of his rulers and would esteem a thing true or false good or evil just or unjust in obedience to their dictates however we have shown already chapter seventeen that no man's mind can possibly lie wholly at the disposition of another for no one can willingly transfer his natural right of free reason and judgment or be compelled to do so for this reason government which attempts to control minds is accounted tyrannical and it is considered an abuse of sovereignty and a usurpation of the rights of subjects to seek to prescribe what shall be accepted as true or rejected as false or what opinions should actuate men in their worship of god all these questions fall within a man's natural right which he cannot abdicate even with his own consent i admit that the judgment can be biased in many ways and to an almost incredible degree so that while exempt from direct external control it may be so dependent on another man's words that it may fitly be said to be ruled by him but although this influence is carried to great lengths it has never gone so far as to invalidate the statement that every man's understanding is his own and that brains are as diverse as palates moses not by fraud but by divine virtue gained such a hold over the popular judgment that he was accounted superhuman and believed to speak and act through the inspiration of the deity nevertheless even he could not escape murmurs and evil interpretations how much less then can other monarchs avoid them yet such unlimited power if it exists at all must belong to a monarch and least of all to a democracy where the whole or a great part of the people wield authority collectively this is a fact which i think every one can explain for himself however unlimited therefore the power of the sovereign may be however implicitly it is trusted as the exponent of law and religion it can never prevent men from forming judgments according to their intellect or being influenced by any given emotion it is true that it has a right to treat as enemies all men whose opinions do not on all subjects entirely coincide with its own but we are not discussing its strict rights but its proper course of action i grant that it has the right to rule in the most violent manner and to put citizens to death for very trivial causes but no one supposes it can do this with the approval of sound judgment nay inasmuch as such things cannot be done without extreme peril to itself we may even deny that it has the absolute power to do them or consequently the absolute right for the rights of the sovereign are limited by his power since therefore no one can abdicate his freedom of judgment and feeling since every man is by indefeasible natural right the master of his own thoughts it follows that men thinking in diverse and contradictory fashions cannot without disastrous results be compelled to speak only according to the dictates of the supreme power not even the most experienced to say nothing of the multitude know how to keep silence men's common failing is to confide their plans to others though there be need for secrecy so that a government would be most harsh which deprived the individual of his freedom of saying and teaching what he thought and would be moderate if such freedom were granted still we cannot deny that authority may be as much injured by words as by actions hence although the freedom we are discussing cannot be entirely denied to subjects its unlimited concession would be most baneful we must therefore now inquire how far such freedom can and ought to be conceded without danger to the peace of the state or the power of the rulers and this as i said at the beginning of chapter sixteen is my principal object it follows plainly from the explanation given above of the foundations of a state that the ultimate aim of government is not to rule or restrain by fear nor to exact obedience but contrariwise 
to free every man from fear that he may live in all possible security in other words to strengthen his natural right to exist and work without injury to himself or others no the object of government is not to change men from rational beings into beasts or puppets but to enable them to develop their minds and bodies in security and to employ their reason unshackled neither showing hatred anger or deceit nor watched with the eyes of jealousy and injustice in fact the true aim of government is liberty now we have seen that in forming a state the power of making laws must either be vested in the body of the citizens or in a portion of them or in one man for although men's free judgments are very diverse each one thinking that he alone knows everything and although complete unanimity of feeling and speech is out of the question it is impossible to preserve peace unless individuals abdicate their right of acting entirely on their own judgment therefore the individual justly cedes the right of free action though not of free reason and judgment no one can act against the authorities without danger to the state though his feelings and judgment may be at variance therewith he may even speak against them provided that he does so from rational conviction not from fraud anger or hatred and provided that he does not attempt to introduce any change on his private authority for instance supposing a man shows that a law is repugnant to sound reason and should therefore be repealed if he submits his opinion to the judgment of the authorities who alone have the right of making and repealing laws and meanwhile acts in no wise contrary to that law he has deserved well of the state and has behaved as a good citizen should but if he accuses the authorities of injustice and stirs up the people against them or if he seditiously strives to abrogate the law without their consent he is a mere agitator and rebel thus we see how an individual may declare and teach what he believes without injury to the authority of his rulers or to the public peace namely by leaving in their hands the entire power of legislation as it affects action and by doing nothing against their laws though he be compelled often to act in contradiction to what he believes and openly feels to be best such a course can be taken without detriment to justice and dutifulness nay it is the one which a just and dutiful man would adopt we have shown that justice is dependent on the laws of the authorities so that no one who contravenes their accepted decrees can be just while the highest regard for duty as we have pointed out in the preceding chapter is exercised in maintaining public peace and tranquillity these could not be preserved if every man were to live as he pleased therefore it is no less than undutiful for a man to act contrary to his country's laws for if the practice became universal the ruin of states would necessarily follow hence so long as a man acts in obedience to the laws of his rulers he in no wise contravenes his reason for in obedience to reason he transferred the right of controlling his actions from his own hands to theirs this doctrine we can confirm from actual custom for in a conference of great and small powers schemes are seldom carried unanimously yet all unite in carrying out what is decided on whether they voted for or against but i return to my proposition from the fundamental notions of a state we have discovered how a man may exercise free judgment without detriment to the supreme power from the same premises we can no less easily determine what opinions would be seditious evidently those which by their very nature nullify the compact by which the right of free action was ceded for instance a man who holds that the supreme power has no rights over him or that promises ought not to be kept or that every one should live as he pleases or other doctrines of this nature in direct opposition to the above-mentioned contract is seditious not so much from his actual opinions and judgment as from the deeds which they involve for he who maintains such theories abrogates the contract which tacitly or openly he made with his rulers other opinions which do not involve acts violating the contract such as revenge anger and the like are not seditious unless it be in some corrupt state where superstitious and ambitious persons unable to endure men of learning are so popular with the multitude that their word is more valued than the law however i do not deny that there are some doctrines which while they are apparently only concerned with abstract truths and falsehoods are yet propounded and published with unworthy motives the question we have discussed in chapter fifteen and show that reason should nevertheless remain unshackled if we hold the principle that a man's loyalty to the state should be judged like his loyalty to god from his actions only namely from his charity towards his neighbours we cannot doubt that the best government will allow freedom of philosophical speculation no less than of religious belief 
I confess that from such freedom inconveniences may sometimes arise. But what question was ever settled so wisely that no abuses could possibly spring therefrom? He who seeks to regulate everything by law is more likely to arouse vices than to reform them. It is best to grant what cannot be abolished, even though it be in itself harmful. How many evils spring from luxury, envy, avarice, drunkenness, and the like? Yet these are tolerated, vices as they are, because they cannot be prevented by legal enactments. How much more, then, should free thought be granted, seeing that it is in itself a virtue, and that it cannot be crushed? Besides, the evil results can easily be checked, as I will show, by the secular authorities, not to mention that such freedom is absolutely necessary for progress in science and the liberal arts, for no man follows such pursuits to advantage unless his judgment be entirely free and unhampered. But let it be granted that freedom may be crushed, and men be so bound down that they do not dare to utter a whisper, save at the bidding of their rulers. Nevertheless, this can never be carried to the pitch of making them think according to authority so that the necessary consequences would be that men would daily be thinking one thing and saying another to the corruption of good faith that mainstay of government and to the fostering of hateful flattery and perfidy whence spring stratagems and the corruption of every good art it is far from possible to impose uniformity of speech for the more rulers strive to curtail freedom of speech the more obstinately are they resisted not indeed by the avaricious the flatterers and other numbskulls who think supreme salvation consists in filling their stomachs and gloating over their money-bags, but by those whom good education, sound morality, and virtue have rendered more free. Men, as generally constituted, are most prone to resent the branding as criminal of opinions which they believe to be true, and the proscriptions as wicked of that which inspires them with piety towards God and man. Hence they are ready to forswear the laws and conspire against the authorities, thinking it not shameful but honourable, to stir up seditions and perpetuate any sort of crime with this end in view such being the constitution of human nature we see that laws directed against opinions affect the generous minded rather than the wicked and are adapted less for coercing criminals than for irritating the upright so that they cannot be maintained without great peril to the state moreover such laws are almost always useless for those who hold that the opinions proscribed are sound cannot possibly obey the law whereas those who already reject them as false accept the law as a kind of privilege and make such boast of it that authority is powerless to repeal it even if such a course be subsequently desired to these considerations may be added what we said in chapter eighteen in treating of the history of the hebrews and lastly how many schisms have arisen in the church from the attempt of the authorities to decide by law the intricacies of theological controversy if men were not allured by the hope of getting the law and the authorities on their side of triumphing over their adversaries in the sight of an applauding multitude and of acquiring honourable distinctions they would not strive so maliciously nor would such fury sway their minds this is taught not only by reason but by daily examples for laws of this kind prescribing what every man shall believe and forbidding any one to speak or write to the contrary have often been passed as sops or concessions to the anger of those who cannot tolerate men of enlightenment and who by such harsh and crooked enactments can easily turn the devotion of the masses into fury and direct it against whom they will how much better would it be to restrain popular angst and fury instead of passing useless laws which can only be broken by those who love virtue and the liberal arts thus paring down the state till it is too small to harbour men of talent what greater misfortune for a state can be conceived than that honourable men should be sent like criminals into exile because they hold diverse opinions which they cannot disguise what i say can be more hurtful than that men who have committed no crime or wickedness should simply because they are enlightened be treated as enemies and put to death and that the scaffold the terror of evil doers should become the arena where the highest examples of tolerance and virtue are displayed to the people with all the marks of ignominy that authority can devise he that knows himself to be upright does not fear the death of a criminal and shrinks from no punishment his mind is not wrung with remorse for any disgraceful deed he holds that death in a good cause is no punishment but an honour and that death for freedom is glory what purpose then is served by the death of such men what example is proclaimed the cause for which they die is unknown to the idle and the foolish hateful to the turbulent loved by the upright the only lesson we can draw from such scenes is to flatter the persecutor or else to imitate the victim 
if formal assent is not to be esteemed above conviction and if governments are to retain a firm hold of authority and not be compelled to yield to agitators it is imperative that freedom of judgment should be granted so that men may live together in harmony however diverse or even openly contradictory their opinions may be we cannot doubt that such is the best system of government and open to the fewest objections since it is the one most in harmony with human nature in a democracy the most natural form of government as we have shown in chapter sixteen every one submits to the control of authority over his actions but not over his judgment and reason that is seeing that all cannot think alike the voice of the majority has the force of law subject to repeal if circumstances bring about a change of opinion in proportion as the power of free judgment is withheld we depart from the natural condition of mankind and consequently the government becomes more tyrannical in order to prove that from such freedom no inconvenience arises which cannot easily be checked by the exercise of the sovereign power and that men's actions can easily be kept in bounds though their opinions be at open variance it will be well to cite an example such an one is not very far to seek the city of amsterdam reaps the fruit of this freedom in its own great prosperity and in the admiration of all other people for in this most flourishing state and most splendid city men of every nation and religion live together in the greatest harmony and ask no questions before trusting their goods to a fellow-citizen save whether he be rich or poor and whether he generally acts honestly or the reverse his religion and sect is considered of no importance for it has no effect before the judges in gaining or losing a cause and there is no sect so despised that its followers provided that they harm no one pay every man his due and lived uprightly are deprived of the protection of the magisterial authority on the other hand when the religious controversy between remonstrance and counter remonstrance began to be taken up by politicians and the states it grew into a schism and abundantly showed that laws dealing with religion and seeking to settle its controversies are much more calculated to irritate than to reform and that they give rise to extreme license further it was seen that schisms do not originate in a love of truth which is a source of courtesy and gentleness but rather in an inordinate desire for supremacy from all these considerations it is clearer than the sun at noonday that the true schismatics are those who condemn other men's writings and seditiously stir up the quarrelsome masses against their authors rather than those authors themselves who generally write only for the learned and appeal solely to reason in fact the real disturbers of the peace are those who in a free state seek to curtail the liberty of judgment which they are unable to tyrannize over i have thus shown one that it is impossible to deprive men of the liberty of saying what they think two that such liberty can be conceded to every man without injury to the rights and authority of the sovereign power and that every man may retain it without injury to such rights provided that he does not presume upon it to the extent of introducing any new rights into the state or acting in any way contrary to the existing laws three that every man may enjoy this liberty without detriment to the public peace and that no inconvenience arises therefrom which cannot easily be checked four that every man may enjoy it without injury to his allegiance five that laws dealing with speculative problems are entirely useless six lastly that not only may such liberty be granted without prejudice to the public peace to loyalty and to the rights of rulers but that it is even necessary for their preservation for when people try to take it away and bring to trial not only the acts which alone are capable of offending but also the opinions of mankind they only succeed in surrounding their victims with an appearance of martyrdom and raise feelings of pity and revenge rather than of terror uprightness and good faith are thus corrupted flatterers and traitors are encouraged and sectarians triumph inasmuch as concessions have been made to their animosity and they have gained the state sanction for the doctrines of which they are the interpreters hence they arrogate to themselves the state authority and rights and do not scruple to assert they have been directly chosen by god and that their laws are divine whereas the laws of the state are human and should therefore yield obedience to the laws of god in other words to their own laws every one must see that this is not a state of affairs conducive to public welfare wherefore as we have shown in chapter eighteen the safest way for a state is to lay down the rule that religion is comprised solely in the exercise of charity and justice and that the rights of rulers in sacred no less than in secular matters should merely have to do with actions but that every man should think what he likes and say what he thinks i have thus fulfilled the task i set myself in this treatise it remains only to call attention to the fact 
that i have written nothing which i do not most willingly submit to the examination and approval of my country's rulers and that i am willing to retract anything which they shall decide to be repugnant to the laws or prejudicial to the public good i know that i am a man and as a man liable to error but against error i have taken scrupulous care and have striven to keep an entire accordance with the laws of my country with loyalty and with morality end of section twenty two Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. End of